come to this event today. Very happy that we can be together. Bonjour à tous. Uh, francophone, eh, benvenuti a tutti. Italiani. I don't know whether that was correct, but it sounded at least like Italian. Um, we do have, uh, as far as I know, participants from abroad, and this is why we have the entire meeting in English. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to all the contributions. We have a, I'm going to show you the program. Um, we have a, an exciting program um, put together, I think. We will start with the keynote from Niall Dawson from North Road, and then uh, we'll have a first block with Marco, Matteo, and Lucy before the break, which is supposed to take place around 11-ish, a little, um, to start 10 to 11, hopefully. Please keep time. Um, that's my message to the presenter. However, um, all the participants, um, if you if you want to jump in, jump out, hop on, hop on, feel free to do so. Um, just one request from my or from our side, please do mute your microphone and if it helps also switch off your camera, that might um, get us a better performance. And with this, I think I'm going to hand over to Niall or respectively um, the stream, the video that he recorded. I hope you're going to have a great morning. As you can see, we will continue shortly after 11 until around 20 to 1 uh, with a second block and lots of interesting stuff. Enjoy the morning, enjoy the presentations, and uh, yeah, hope to talk to you in one way or another soon. Over to Niall. Okay, yeah, so, uh, I'll just do a quick, um, <laughs> just give you a quick word as well um, before starting. So thank you very much, uh, Hans Jörg, for introducing um, this morning. My pleasure. Um, we have uh, first a video from Niall because he, yeah, he's situated in Aust in Australia, um, so it's a bit risky to have him directly here. I'll just do a quick introduction to him. So he is the head of North Road. Uh, which is a company that offers QGIS development services and training related to geospatial data and maps. He's a core developer of QGIS and very active in the community. Uh, he's also a QGIS honorary member since 2020, so this year. And as I said, he lives in, um, in Australia, so he just prepared a video for us. So we will show this now and then we will continue with the, the next ones. So. Please let us know in the chat uh, if you have any problems hearing us or if there is a, um, a question that you have related to the presentations. We try to uh, gather them for the end of the presentation so you can ask the presenters directly. So we'll start with the video. Hopefully this will work. Hello everyone, my name is Niall Dawson. I'm from a company called North Road um, and I'm also one of the developers in the QGIS project. Thanks for having me on your virtual meetup today. Uh, it's a real honor to be here and presenting to you. I'm going to be speaking a little bit today about a brief history of time in QGIS. What I mean by that is a brief history of how QGIS has handled uh, time, the time dimension um, and time values and animations and all that kind of wonderful stuff. I, I find this a really uh, interesting topic, firstly, because there's been a, a whole lot of developments that we'll get to a little bit later in QGIS 3.14 relating to how QGIS handles uh, time and temporal uh, animations. But mostly I find this a really great example of how the QGIS development actually works in reality. Um, so that's why I've entitled today's presentation, A Brief History of Time in QGIS, because we're actually going to be stepping back right to the early history of QGIS and look at how um, those early versions handled time and then how things have changed and sort of evolved um, 
getting to where we are today with QGIS 3.14 and all its native wonderful time handling capabilities that we've got now. So if we're looking at QGIS and time, the, the very first thing we have to mention is, like I said, going back in time before QGIS 3.14. I've, I've entitled this section the prequels. The earliest uh, time handling capabilities that QGIS gained was around about 2011. Um, so that's going back a long time in the QGIS project uh, with the Time Manager plugin. So Time Manager is um, it's still uh, an existing QGIS plugin. As far as I could tell, the, the kind of earliest mentions of it that I could find on the internet at least were around about 2011. So it's way, way back in the QGIS history is when it first came. Uh, Time Manager is developed by Anita Grazer and Carolina. Um, and they've been doing a great job in maintaining and developing and, and exposing this kind of temporal dimension to QGIS for, for years and years, almost a decade. When back in 2011, when Time Manager was first introduced to QGIS as a QGIS plugin, uh, it initially only had vector handling capability. So it was a way of uh, exploring that time dimension with vector layers. Um, here's a video demonstrating one of the early versions of, of Time Manager and showing its, uh, showing its vector animation capabilities. Um, I really like this video because you can see just how far QGIS in general has come since, since this kind of era uh, in terms of all the, the interface about how you style layers. It's obviously like a lot more options now. Um, but you can see here uh, in this, this video, it kind of demos how uh, with a vector layer, you could set up a, um, an animation taking a, a starting time from a, a, a field value inside that layer. Um, and then using this little slider and the, the play button, you could actually animate that and see that uh, the, the layer being filtered dynamically on the fly to uh, show, show features based on their, their time values. So that was one of the earliest versions of uh, the Time Manager plugin. But since then, uh, the current versions of Time Manager have got so much more functionality. So uh, now it's got enhanced abilities for vectors. There's a lot more options in how vectors are animated through Time Manager. It also has some, some raster time handling abilities. So it can do um, uh, some W, uh, sorry, some HDF, I believe, and some WMST uh, time animations. Has a great setting in there for interpolation and uh, field uh, feature tracking, and also this archaeology mode for um, dates going right back before kind of the, the current date systems. Maybe the next milestone in QGIS time handling and kind of the, the history of of time in QGIS. It's about 2013 where this thing was introduced into the Time Manager plugin, a new function called Animation Date Time. I tried to find a bit about the history of this. Um, it was an email I, I, I put together actually. So this this came from a from my old old email box um, where I was chatting to Anita and uh, I'd seen that Nathan Woodrow had, had made this ability for plugins to actually start extending and expose their own sort of custom expression functions in QGIS. And, and there was this idea of like, maybe we can, we can tie uh, that, that functionality that Nathan had added about user defined Python expression functions with Time Manager and actually make a, a QGIS expression function, which would expose the, the current Time Manager date time. Um, it's a funny email, so it was like 2011, it was kind of, or 2013, it was right back when I was first getting introduced and, and getting started with QGIS. Um, I had a thing here, not got a lot of Python experience, so there we go. Um, but using this, this new uh, animation date time expression function, it meant that we could do things like this and we could, uh, instead of just getting that direct switch on switch off thing that Time Manager originally had, uh, we now had the ability to basically fade out things and, and change their appearance as the, as the 
their canvas time changed from the um, initial switch on time. Um, so we ended up with things like this and we'd have these expressions with a animation date time function, which was like a little thing being a function being exposed by the time manager plugin uh, chained with a whole bunch of other QGIS expression functions for manipulating color. Uh, and you'd get things like this, you'd be able to fade off a of polygon's color over time. Um, so that kind of brought a whole lot more interest to the exports from time manager, because now instead of just being a, a direct on or off, we could actually like change their appearance over time. So we got, there's a whole lot of animations coming out at the time where features would fade away or the colors would kind of change or their opacity would, would, would change. Um, or like here, their, their size would actually drop off as they, as they kind of got older, those features. The next big milestone we hit, so 2017. So that's about four years from that animation date time uh, function was introduced to the time manager plugin. So in 2017, we've now got this function uh, called, uh, I call this a hack, but a function was introduced to QGIS called the epoch function. And this got quickly abused in ways that we never really would have expected. So the epoch function was originally introduced as a way of getting a, a date time value and turning it into the, the milliseconds since the Unix epoch. So it's kind of just a, a, a fairly typical expression function for working with date times to turn a, a date value into just a numeric value in milliseconds. Um, so it was originally added so that uh, we'd have the ability to, to take a value an attribute value, a date attribute value, convert it to some sort of numeric value so that we could style it by, say, change a color, color ramp size um, using a graduated renderer. Uh, around about the same time, um, I had funding from uh, an anonymous source to add uh, the ability to automatically refresh a layer in QGIS at a given interval. So this, this functionality basically let you go in and say, um, every X seconds, this layer should be redrawn. I think I've got a demo here. Yeah, I do. Um, so in this demo, we can see, uh, go in and switch on this setting, the refresh layer at interval, and basically tell QGIS that every one second, this layer should be redrawn. Um, in this in this demo video, the, the back, the data source in the back end was changing. So it's basically every every time it gets refreshed, we'd see the points move. Um, and we've got a bit of, that kind of exposes a bit of animation, I guess you could say, because the, if the data source is changing, then QGIS has now got the ability to redraw and automatically update to see the new value, the new positions of those features. Perhaps the nicest thing about that uh, feature being added was it was also an excuse to fix up a lot of the um, uh, improve the situation with rendering layers really quickly. So uh, the render caching ability in QGIS was improved so that we, we did have that ability to refresh the layer. And you could see there in that animation, we we could crank it right up to 30 frames a second, 60 frames a second, and it was still nice and smooth. Um, but these two features were basically smashed together in a really, a really kind of a hacky way, I think you would say, um, with this, this magical kind of concept of taking the epoch of the current date time. So this is a QGIS expression function. The epoch, remember, gets a date time value, turns it into a millisecond since a reference time value. So we've got here, uh, the epoch of the current date time, this is always going to be increasing every time we refresh the map, the millisecond value will be uh, going up and up and up. Um, taking away some kind of seed value. So the, the features would have a seed value, a fixed attribute inside that feature. So basically every time we refresh, we're getting a little, uh, an, an incrementing counter. That means that we can, we can use this as the basis for an animation. And that led to this kind of wonderful stuff. So in this demo, you can see uh, what I did was I made a that seed value is called creation there. It's 
basically just got a, uh, a, a random number in there. And then some data defined symbology is set up where we use that similar kind of uh, concept of taking the epoch of now, taking away that seed value. Um, I do some kind of silly stuff with the size based assistant and then switch on that setting to automatically refresh. So each time the layer is being redrawn, the now value is being updated because time is moving on. So the epoch's changing and we can we can start getting these kind of quasi animated symbols in, in QGIS. And you can see in this video, I, I really went on to, to abuse that ability and um, using it with, with many of the different data defined settings for a symbol, uh, just to see what kind of crazy outcome we could get. I have no idea. There, there was no, no practical basis behind this video at all. I basically wanted to see how, uh, just what kind of crazy stuff we could get. And there's the kind of end result. The, the points are moving around because it's got a data defined offset for the point that's again based on that epoch kind of now value. And it gives that, that animated effect. It made for some really cool YouTube videos, but uh, it's kind of impractical because there was actually no way to export those animations out of QGIS. And secondly, the, the points themselves were always fixed. It wasn't real time handling. They were kind of like, animated symbols, but disjoint from the actual, any kind of real world time value. Uh, but anyway, it, it was, like I said, used and abused in many different ways, even to this kind of thing where we've got um, Q just being used to make just a, uh, an animation. No Python used here, just Q just symbology using that epoch function with the, the ability to automatically refresh a layer uh, on a certain interval. Um, if you want to see the full version of this video, there's a, you can search on YouTube for, uh, in, into the depth of madness with QGIS. It was a, a presentation I did at a QGIS conference quite a while back, but, um, there's a, a whole bunch, there's a story behind it. And then we, we kind of dig back and explore exactly how the symbology was set up in this, in this project. Anyway, that's, that was all a bit of a hack, but like I said, made for some really cool demos and, and people were, were excited to see uh, how they could use those, those two functions together. That leads us up to 2019. So the next milestone that we can look at in QGIS's temporal history happened in 2019 with uh, the ability to add animations to mesh layers. So this was came out of um, a developer from Lutra Consulting. Uh, and in this little demo, we can see for a mesh layer loaded into that project, um, uh, the ability was added to basically animate that, that mesh layer. Now, the thing about this, this functionality is it's totally disjoint from the rest of QGIS. So it worked for mesh layers only. You can see the, the little time controlling option here is inside um, the styling for a mesh layer. Um, so it was nice. It was like a, it was a, a great feature to be able to animate those and see kind of flood modeling change over time and, uh, or, or whether variables change over time. Um, but it, it was really, uh, quite demonstrative of the, the disjointed way that time had been handled in QGIS up to that stage. So, so now we kind of had this situation where there was a time manager plugin which did vectors, did a lot of rasters, um, and could handle multiple layers at once. Then we had meshes kind of sitting over here in their own little isolated silo where you could animate a mesh layer. You could only do one layer at once. Um, and there was sort of no way to tie those two together. You couldn't animate a, a vector layer at the same time as a mesh and see the two changing um, as the time changed. So that brings us up to, to QGIS 3.14 in our brief history of time. Um, 
so the next chapter in, in QGIS's history of time really was triggered by the Meteorological Ser Service of Canada, uh, who approached Cartosa and with the request to add the ability to view temporal WMS services in, in QGIS. And they, they wanted that as part of the, the out-of-the-box QGIS um, install. Um, so this kind of started off, or oh, it's about, oh, we can see here. So mid mid 2018, these discussions started with the um, the Canadian organisation, um, and it, it it was quickly identified that this was this was the opportunity we've been looking for to um, to go back and rethink temporal support in QGIS and see if there was a, a smarter, kind of better way we could do it. Um, and, you know, most especially tie in all these kind of different approaches into one unified uh, QGIS temporal support. So in, in July, 2018, a, a QGIS enhancement proposal was, was um, submitted on behalf of that uh, Canadian organization to say like, here's a possible approach that we could use to start bringing temporal support as like a first class citizen in QGIS and, and pulling all these extra little bits in together. Um, this was a little bit optimistic, I think, it was targeted for version 3.4, definitely or later, because 3.14, yeah. Um, anyway, about almost two years later, um, that work actually kicked off uh, and it was it was one of those things where this temporal handling it, it definitely a team effort it wasn't one single organization driving it it wasn't one single uh sponsor driving it we we saw in the history of of time handling in QGIS it was a lot of different people a lot of different developers um, a lot of different organizations and uh and players who sort of came together uh to to develop this proposal um, that's one of the reasons why I think it's a fantastic example of QGIS development, because uh, despite there being many different organisations involved, uh, it definitely is like a collaborative effort, and there, um, you know, everybody was working together to to get this awesome QGIS temporal handling as an end result. Uh, so earlier this year, in January, there was basically like a, a forum, a virtual forum was organised with um, a whole lot of people and organisations who'd previously been involved in or shown interest in time management in QGIS um, to get together and just have a chat about how we can how we can push this forward um, and really bring it all into like a, a unified approach. Went really well and we basically came to all an agreement. So uh, everybody was on the same page. We had an approach that meant that we could move forward with this. And finally, we had that, that unified approach to, to see uh, time handling brought into QGIS itself. Which brings us up to QGIS 3.14. So QGIS 3.14, which is uh, due out shortly, is when all this work was targeted for. Um, and again, I think this is like a fantastic example of the way a new feature, which has been added to QGIS, gets extended really quickly by uh, a whole bunch of different sort of separate um, stakeholders just come together and, and take the work that somebody initially does and adds on bits to it, uh, refines it, and then you end up with something that's so much more than that initial uh, that initial body of work could ever have really envisaged. So chapter one in our QGIS 3.14 temporal story starts with WMST. Uh, confusingly, confusingly, WMST is actually WMS temporal. It, it's uh, it's not the same thing as WMTS, which is the WMM web mapping tiled specification. It's a completely different beast to WFST, which is transactional WFS. So WMST is WMS plus temporal. I think there's even WMTST in some really rare circumstances, just to make things extra tricky. Uh, so WMST, this is the this was the initial driver. This is what the uh, 
Canadian Meteorological Society needed to see in QGIS. Um, and like I said, they, they'd approached Cartosa. So most of the WMST, actually almost all of the WMST work was done by Sam Welly um, from Cartosa. Uh, I was involved a little bit as a kind of um, uh, mentor slash API guide, uh, but definitely Sam Welly is to be credited with the bulk of the, the temporal handling in QGIS that we see in 3.14. Uh, here's a little demo that we can see of a WMST layer that's been loaded into QGIS. And I took this, I took this screencast uh, straight from the initial pull request that was made when WMST uh, handling was, was first added early in the QGIS 3.14 cycle. Um, I, I wanted to do that instead of taking a new video of what it stands like today, because we'll see a little bit as we as we go further the evolution of how uh, the the time interface changed over the course of the 3.14 development cycle and was refined. So we can see here um, quite rudimentary, really, like the the doc here uh, has some options there for the for the rewind and the play and the pause. Well, obviously, um, some some spacing issues there, uh, and uh, quite a lot of settings there as well that were being exposed. Um, but the you know the key thing here is we've now got a an inbuilt framework that that uh, layers and different data sources could use, and we could they could all take advantage of that same underlying uh, approach to handling time in QGIS. So WMST was really the first, the first uh, implementation that took advantage of that. Uh, so here's another screen actually. So this is the, the second iteration we can see of the, of the actual UI for the, the time handling in QGIS. You can see it's been refined a little bit. We've got a few uh, changes. So there's now um, options to jump straight to the first frame and last frame. We can see there's a loop settings being added there to, to basically loop the animation. And some of the more, uh, the less frequently changed settings have been moved to this extra advanced settings uh, panel to avoid avoid that clutter of too many controls visible at once. Still work to do, but we can see um, things are getting a little bit more refined. Uh, at the same time, actually, uh, as WMST support was added, we also got basic support for any raster layer to have a temporal range set for it. So this setting is really like the the kind of lowest common denominator. You can use it with a just a JPEG source or a TIFF source, which has kind of got no no concept of time to it. Um, and in this mode, if you tick the little temporal checkbox, you can go in there and just say this layer should be shown in this date range. So it's kind of like if you've got uh, maybe you've got 20 different rasters showing aerial imagery over a certain area taken at different snapshots of time, you could go in there and you could set up these time frames, these time ranges that each one should switch on and off. Um, and then you get the ability to animate any kind of raster uh, at a rudimentary layer. Okay, chapter two in our 3.14 temporal story um, is about mesh layers. So uh, we have a developer from Lutra Consulting who added the ability to, um, who moved actually, moved that that isolated little silo we saw where a mesh layer could be animated in older QGIS versions, uh, moved all that, brought it into line with the, the new wonderful unified approach. So now instead of having its own separate little animation control, mesh layers would take advantage of this standard temporal controller um, and it also meant that we could now have the ability to take different layer, different sources like a WMST source um, with time capabilities and a mesh layer as well with a time capability and then animate them at the same time. So we could make a project stacking up these different layer sources and using the one 
the one temporal controller basically explore the time dimension across all of the layers in our project. So this is where we really started to see the um, that unified approach payoff. Chapter three uh, is when Postgres raster temporal support was introduced. So this was done by Alessandro um, with sponsorship from uh, ARPA Piemont. Uh, and what Alessandro did is he added the ability to load in uh, if you had a Postgres table with multiple rows and each row has a, a raster associated with it, you could actually load those in as a temporal layer and say that the, the row that's the raster that's being displayed will actually be controlled by the, the temporal controller. So with this, we had three different sources now that we could tie together in that, that temporal handling. So we could do the WMST, actually four different sources, because we had the WMST, we had the mesh layers, Postgres raster, um, raster collections, and also that, that rudimentary ability to, to animate any, any raster from a fixed time range. So we can see the initial uh, target of just exposing WMST support in QGIS 3.14, uh, we've already gone so far beyond that. So we've now got multiple different sources instead of just that um, WMST. Chapter four uh, was when print layouts were made time aware. So this was a bit of a joint effort. Um, again, we have Vincent from Latra. We also have Matteo from uh, I'm Here Asia, who uh, separately kind of worked together to, to do this. Vincent added the, the core API calls for it. Uh, and Matteo actually exposed that in, in the UI so that users could use it. Um, but this is really cool because now in a in a print layout like this one, a map can be turned into a temporal map. Uh, so this this demo here, we can see you can opt in to say actually this map in my in my print layout should show a certain time range, a fixed time range. And as that time range has changed, it controls which layers we or which data sets we actually see from those WMSs or the the rasters or the meshes and uh, Etc. Um, so that's fantastic because this, when this was added, we then had the ability to set up a print layout where we might have multiple maps and they each would show a, a different time range. So you could possibly have like, you know, half a dozen maps in this layout, one showing January, February, March, and basically showing different slices of time for, for the same data sets. You kind of get that small multiples uh, visualization technique going. Uh, but the other really cool thing here is that when it was added, we saw uh, uh, Matteo also added the ability to data define these start and end times. So that meant that the start and end time for a map could actually be taken from a, a field inside a print atlas. So with that, we now have the ability to do these kind of spatio-temporal print atlases where not only will the map move around as the atlas is exported, but it could also filter in time if you've got a start and an end time inside that atlas coverage layer. So that means that um, uh, it opens up a whole range of possibilities of, of time-based atlases because uh, you could even have an, an atlas where the, the map is a static view, it doesn't change, but we're actually just changing the time range and then we export uh, a whole atlas where the, the, that map view changes month by month. So that was really cool. Okay, chapter five uh, is, is vector handling. So vector handling, um, I, I wrote that one myself, kind of sponsored by North Road, I guess you'd say. Um, Actually, more, more technically, it was it was probably more accurately sponsored by a company called Insomnia Inc. Uh, kind of, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but the the reality is this was actually uh, uh, I added the vector support for time for QGIS time handling. It was it was back in those really kind of early days of COVID when uh, the supermarkets looked like this, and 
you know, nobody was really sure what was happening. I wasn't sleeping at all. I was sleeping like a couple of hours a night and then I'd just sit in bed and I'd be, I'd be wide awake and my brain would be sort of rushing at like a thousand miles an hour. And there was, um, there was one night where I'd kind of slept for an hour and I just couldn't get back to sleep. Uh, I'd finished the book I was reading and I was just there. I was like, this is ridiculous. Um, so, so I got up and I was like, I'm just going to, I'm going to do something in queue just totally for the fun of it, totally because I want to, uh, because I really enjoy working on QGIS. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to add, I'm going to add the ability to, to put vector support into this time handling. Because we've got, um, you know, we've got all these, this wonderful framework. We've, we've now got the ability to do the rasters and the WMSs and the, the meshes, but without vectors, it's kind of, it's kind of missing almost the most important uh, capability. Um, so I got up and it was like 1 a.m. and I just sat there for a couple of hours and basically hacked this together so that uh, so that we could ensure that QGIS 3.14, when it came out, it had that vector support in the time handling as well. And here's a little demo that we can see uh, where we get that sort of time manager style vector animation where features can switch on and off based on uh, the time attributes inside the, the data for that for that layer. Um, we can also see in here there's been a bit more of evolution inside the, the UI for, uh, for the time controller that's been refined a little bit more. Um, but again I, I was really happy when when we got the, the vector handling for for the new temporal controller, uh, because I could get back and I could start making my my fun maps that I really liked, where features sort of pulse in and out over time and fade in and out. And and I really love this because um, now that we've got this inbuilt time capabilities in QGIS, we could we could start doing things that weren't possible in uh, in Time Manager. So QGIS plugins can do a lot. But then there's certain things that you might just need to get a bit more low level. And so by, by moving this kind of time handling into the main QGIS core, we could, we could really take advantage of some um, low level optimizations and just get fast, fast animations so that you could do things like this um, and then just tweak the, tweak the variables on the fly and see that result immediately as it's animating. Uh, Another another little step in the the QGIS 3.14 story, we see Sam Welly jump back in from Cartosa, and he added the ability to uh, he added the the concept of a cumulative mode for the the time manager for the time controller, where basically that time range that's visible on your map has a fixed starting point, but it's the end point that varies. So we basically see the map build up over time instead of just a, a slice of time that that uh, tracks through the animation. Chapter seven is when um, we're getting closer to the release of QGIS 3.14, or closer to the, the feature freeze at least. Um, and we see a bunch of different players start to put in just some nice finishing touches and polish here. So again, Matteo was probably one of the, the biggest drivers of this. Um, if, you're, if you're not kind of following QGIS development closely, Matteo is, is responsible for many, many of the UI refinements that we see in QGIS today. So he's, he's redrawn a lot of the icons, um, reworked a lot of the way the dialogues kind of flow and the arrangement of widgets and that. Um, and he's really got a, a, an eye for detail in terms of let's make this look like a polished professional uh, program. So we can see here, he's gone in and he's refined again the, the um, user interface for the time controller. And this is more, this is basically what it looks like today if you get QGIS 3.14. Uh, so we can see here it's moved from the bottom of the screen up to the top. That was done for a couple of reasons. First off, because uh, when it was the, 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 the time handling was down at the bottom, it kind of got in the way of things like the Python console and the log window. There was a lot of uh, things 
that want to sit down at the bottom of that QGIS window, but nothing wants to sit at the top. So we could move it up to the top and basically get it out of the way of all that other stuff and keep the clutter away. But he's also rearranged a lot of the, the controls here just to make it more streamlined. Uh, one of the, the very final changes actually added for, for the time handling in 3.14 um, came because it was, it was identified that there was a bit of a gap here. We could, we could see a, a moving time slice of that uh, temporal range, but if someone actually had a fixed range that they wanted to look at, say a certain start date and a fixed end date, there was no way to easily just put those in. So this little mode switcher was added where you could have that, that, that middle mode where it's just a, a fixed start date, fixed end date, you put it in manually and that's what you see. You don't get the animation support, but you can basically have fine control over the start and end slice of time that's visible in the map. Um, chapter eight, exports. So this was, uh, this was again, something that I added right at the last minute, just before QGIS 3.14 was, was kind of, uh, went into feature freeze and was locked down. And this is one of those things where we were so proud, like all the people who'd, who'd worked on this time controller, um, and temporal framework in 3.14, were super proud of it. We were, we were like sharing maps on Twitter and, uh, online and they were getting a lot of great feedback and people were excited about it. But I kind of had this little thing in the back of my mind that was, was bugging me was that, uh, you know, when people actually get it and they get the 3.14, they're going to be frustrated because they can only view those animations in QGIS and there's no way to actually export them out so that you can't turn it into a video file to upload to YouTube. You had to use like a screen, uh, screencasting software. And, and I just, I was really frustrated. I was like, I, I don't want to put this out there with all the hard work we've done. Um, and all the awesome abilities and then the only feedback we'll get is people just complaining because they can't get their their animations out um so i kind of sucked it up and i added the ability to export the maps to um to like a frame by frame png file which you could then take in and use a uh, a utility like ffmpeg or something like that to to basically uh stitch those together into a video file that you could then put online, share around. Um, and that really rounded out that kind of temporal features for 3.14. The last little part, the end of our, of our 3.14 temporal saga uh, has happened over the last couple of weeks during the bug fixing period, where we've seen uh, a whole lot of focus being put onto to the underlying handling of, of date and time values in QGIS. So obviously, the temporal framework is kind of meaningless if there's bugs in how QGIS handles date time fields, or there's little inconsistencies between the different data providers and how they handle them. So a whole lot of attention was put on making sure that all the different data providers, if you're using a, a geo package or a Postgres or an Oracle database, would give consistent handling of date time fields. Stack load of unit tests were added to make sure that that's like locked in and that it, we're guaranteed to get that consistent um, that consistent handling. Uh, but the other thing that was done during the bug fixing period is we took care to make sure that um, whenever the time manager is sending off that little time slice to do the filter on of say the start of 2020 to the end of 2020, it's sent off to the back end provider to evaluate. So if you've got a Postgres table with 10 billion records and it's all nicely indexed on your, your date and time fields, uh, basically QGIS will now take advantage of that. It'll send it off. Postgres is responsible to use its indexes and only give back the actual records that fall inside that, that visible time slice. So with that, it meant that massive tables were now could now be animated in real time because we just say, Postgres, you handle that, you use your indexing, or Oracle, you use your indexing, and just give me what I need. And then QGIS only has to render the actual visible points. So that brings us up to QGIS 3.14, the we've uh, nicknamed the temporal release. And we can see just how much things have changed from that kind of initial vision of um, a WMST handling in QGIS to what we've actually got today, where it's almost every single layer source can be animated in one unified approach, you can have a project where 
multiple different layers can be filtered and animated uh, in, at once. We can export them through animations. We can export them through layouts and have uh, that kind of spatio-temporal atlas capability. And it's all really come together from all these different sources, work together to make this fantastic uh, temporal release for QGIS 3.14. Uh, I'll just put a little epilogue on the end because, well, while QGIS 3.14 is fantastic with time handling, there is some extra things that we could be adding in, in future releases that would be nice to see. So one of those is the ability to uh, bring multi-dimensional rasters, such as like a HDF uh, data source or a net CDF data source, um, and use their, their inherent temporal dimensions in that data to be able to expose that to the time uh, capabilities in QGIS would be great. WCS layers as well, so they, they haven't been pulled into this unified time handling yet. Um, 3D animations is one, uh, this is basically the only little uh, animation silo that sort of sits outside of the, the unified approach now. So QGIS if you make a 3D window, you can set up an animation in there. It'd be really nice to tie that back to the temporal handling so you could have a 3D animation that also has the, the layer sources change over time. Um, animated layouts would be great to have. Processing tools to export animations and, and use those in models, also fantastic. Um, a something like a tracking mode. So if you had GPS data and basically you could you could do that sort of interpolation ability that Time Manager plugin still does. Um, and lastly, QGIS Server. QGIS Server has some some temporal capabilities, but it, it needs pulling into line with the uh, the main QGIS temporal thing, so that you can set up your project in QGIS Desktop with all that wonderful temporal capability set up for your layer publish that to your server, and then your server could be a WMST itself where you actually see the data change and a client can use that back in the QGIS time uh, temporal framework. Uh, all this stuff is, you know, potentially to-dos for future. So nice to have, but QGIS 3.14 has got fantastic temporal handling and I think you'll love seeing it. And I, I really can't wait to see the maps that people make, the, the wonderful temporal animations and analysis work that's going to come out of this. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for, for listening to me um, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. Thank you. So I hope you can hear me again. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Noel. It was a great talk and it also introduced some of the speakers that we will have later on. So we have really powerful um, people talking today, so we are really glad about that. Um, I'm just showing one uh, addendum that we had to Niall's presentation. Um, so I just let you read this, a uh, little addition. Okay, and as the next uh, presenter, I would introduce, uh, I would like to introduce Marco Ganasacci, who is a founder and CEO of OpenGIS.ch, uh, OpenGIS.ch. Uh, he's a developer, consultant, and trainer in QGIS, PostGIS, and QField. And he is also chair at the uh, QGIS.org board and member of the QGIS project steering committee. So he's really at the source of uh, knowing about what's happening um, internationally in the development of QGIS. So I will thanks for being with us. Um, Andreas, we, we didn't really hear you. It was very uh, can you hear me? Yes, now it's better. Uh, 
I don't Okay, Marco, um, can you still not hear us? I will try to disable uh, you as a moderator again. Um, okay. Just a little bit of patience. So now you are muted, Marco. I think I can hear you. Uh, please note that um, you should be able to see some polls as participants. So some question, we have some questions for you about uh, where you come from, uh, how you find this kind of um, event. So in the meantime, if there are technical problems, don't hesitate to um, answer these polls. This out for you. Okay, can you see the polls now? If it's not the case, we just wait for Marco and then the polls will be for the break. Okay, so we have we will have to wait uh, for the break for the polls. Um, it was Andy von Laufen who did them, and he had to restart his computer, so it's not for the moment. I hope that Marco will be ready soon. Thank you for your patience. We are all new to this kind of system as well, so I hope uh, we will solve soon the problems. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. <laughs> and it's 9.54. <laughs> Perfectly in time. <laughs> yeah, well, let me just... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, when you when you want to start the presentation nice and relaxed and you've been listening to the amazing presentation by Nayal and then you switch on and everything goes wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's... Um, Good. Um, so, um, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I think uh, I can start. I'll, I'll take the minute I have more. Uh, you can follow along the presentation um, on the link that I just sent in the chat. It is uh, a presentation with a lot of links. So uh, mainly, I will be giving you a couple of news about um, 
uh, what happened lately in the QGIS.org association and then give you a quick overview of a lot of the uh, resources that we have available. I'm not really going to get into the resources because that would need uh, about one hour and uh, so that's why I put a lot of links. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Nayal for the amazing presentation and all all the work that, uh, that you do in QGIS together with all the other developers. So thanks, thanks to all of you. Um, to me, I'm Marco Bernazocchi. I am the, QG, the new QGIS.org uh, chair, and uh, I lead uh, a company in Switzerland called OpenGIS.ch, where we do plenty of uh, core development as well of QGIS and uh, support and uh, uh, build QField. So, um, community news. What happened? Well, first of all, um, the bad news. The only bad news I'm going to tell you today is uh, that, unfortunately, we had to cancel all the Hackfest. The past one in, um, that would have been in Holland in March was uh, canceled right at the beginning of, um, of March when, uh, when it kind of turned out that uh, COVID would uh, change our uh, mode of life. Uh, here you can see a little blog post, and as well, uh, the um, the next Hackfest that would have been held in August in uh, Denmark in Nudebo, uh had holds to be cancelled. So that's the the one bad news, but that's also the only bad news that I'm going to show you today. So from now on, it's all it's all happy. Um, starting with uh, why I'm giving this presentation and why I'm saying. Uh, that there were some changes in the PSC. Well, in uh, May, the um, annual general meeting was held or was uh, closed, finished, and uh, there was a change in the PSC. We have a new chair, which is uh, myself. Uh, we have a new vice chair in uh, Alessandro Pazzotti, and we have the great old treasurer uh, in uh, Andreas Neumann that keeps everything afloat and running and, and does an amazing uh, work that never gets uh, rewarded too much with thank you. So thanks, Andreas, a lot to you for, for juggling all, all those, uh, those tasks. Uh, if you're following the presentation on your, on your own machine, everything that is blue background, you can just click on and uh, it will take you to the to the right place. Uh, just Marco. Yes. Are you sharing your screen right now? Because we can't see anything. Yes, I'm sharing. Sorry. Oh, thank you for stopping. I'll try again. Better? Yes, better. Okay, so let's see. So, Lemon. Oh, Perfect. you missed all my. Oh, you missed all my nice. Uh, my <laughs> nice <imageries. laughs> um, Okay, so these are. This is the history of QGIS very quickly. Um, the link. Uh, myself, for the ones that do not know me, I'm a very outdoor person. Um, the company I lead and the community news we were at. So the Hackfest got canceled. And we were at the chair. Then um, next great news. Uh, Nayal already spoke a lot about it. Um, it is out now. Uh, Friday uh, was the, the, package, the, the release date. So packages are now out at least for Windows and the major um, Linux distributions. I'm honestly, I'm not sure yet about the Mac, but I guess they are already also out there. So 3.14 Pi is out there. Go and try it. Um, another uh, great news regarding more like the, the larger uh, thing happening is that um, QGIS uh, 
as certified as uh, WMS OGC reference implementation. And the uh, so known WFS3, the OGC AP4 feature is also something we are working on getting certified for. So uh, as Nayal said, the, the server is also growing and uh, we got plenty of amazing things happening there as well. Um, another great news is that uh, during the AGM um, this year, we voted to introduce an environmental policy into our statutes. And that is uh, basically where uh, we say that uh, we'd like to try to reduce uh, air mobility and uh, basically uh, think about what we do when we are getting servers. We want to get them in uh, hosters where um, only renewable um, energy is used. And we try to uh, make people use trains over airplanes to get to our physical meetings. And when we are at physical meetings, we also try to um, source local products. So, uh, really nice to have. Uh, really, really nice to see that happening. Uh, if you get want to read the, the details, just uh, just go ahead. On the same um, kind of line, it is not a news at all. Uh, we've had this for ages, but uh, it's obviously recently very, um, very high, uh, ver very discussed subject. We do have a code of conduct. Uh, which tells uh, how to to work with each other, how to be inclusive, how to be friendly. Um, I think uh, we are blessed in community we, uh, in QGS with a great community where these things have mainly been um, um, unused and unneeded because it just worked well. Uh, but uh, again, this is something that Tim. Uh, set up already some years ago, and uh, and then this has uh, been built by the community together. So really something appreciated, and I think that is a here in this sense we we are a good example of uh, of how things can be done and how friendly a community can be. Uh, in the same. Same line, we do have a diversity statement also been there for ages, but probably most people do not know about it. And the main point is that uh, um, we do want to treat everybody equally um, and it doesn't matter to us how people identify themselves or um, anything else. We just care about treating uh, people in the same way and uh, to be very inclusive and very friendly. So again, here we never had issues. And I think uh, that's, uh, that's very good. Then uh, going on to the resources we have uh, at hand to, to help yourself. Uh, well, the first thing is the user groups. Um, we do have about, uh, we have, I think, 24 user groups worldwide currently. So um, uh, just go out and seek your local, uh, your local uh, group, which uh, will, um, will be a very easy way to get in touch with people which are also close to you and which could help you out in a, maybe in your language and so on. Then obviously all that is documentation. Uh, we do have a... a huge amount of documentation around. There are uh, training guides, there are GIS introductions, there are uh, technical documentations, API documentation. So uh, a lot that we do is documented and you will find everything at qgs.org slash uh, your language and then slash docs. Go there, have a look there and, and you will find a lot of resources. So. Uh, don't be shy to, to go and dig around a bit. The QGS.org website in general is a huge, um, huge amount of information. The next place where you can go and help yourself is uh, on Stack Exchange. And here, uh, this is more 
uh, the question and answer kind of place to go. We do not have our own forums. We are relying on Stack Exchange on questions tagged on QGIS, or you can have other things like PostGIS or QField. So it's it's plenty of things. To, it's not only for QGIS Stack Exchange. For who do, do not know that there is there is mathematics programming. So it's it's an immense resource of knowledge. Then to find out uh, what happens in QGIS, well, uh, a lot happens at every release. It is it is a major work every time to get all the features together um, that have happened during uh, during a release cycle, and that is why we publish them on the visual change logs, where you get nice pictures done by the developers uh, that developed the thing themselves, and they put them there so that we can actually see what kind of new features are we talking about. If you do need to uh, create content and uh, you want to publish a bit the fact that you're using QGIS as well. There is a visual style guide where you can get all the logos in all the color variations uh, that are allowed for the logo and gives you a hint on what kind of color codes and so on. Obviously, the plugins repository is, is also a great resource for, um, for getting information, for finding out uh, what kind of plugins are around. Obviously, you can also do it directly in uh, in QGIS itself, but if you need to share the link to a certain plugin to somebody to tell that person, uh, hey, look at, at that pro uh, look at that uh, or that plugin, you can just simply go to plugins.qgs.org and, and uh, get the links there. We also have a news aggregator that takes in a lot of um, um, blog from many people around the world that blog about uh, QGIS. On the other hand, uh, we, you can help yourself, but you can also help us. You can help the association. And uh, if you want to get involved, the best place to start is uh, on QGIS.org, on the Get Involved page. Uh, there you have all the links to everything that you can basically do. After I'm going to, um, I'm selecting a couple of those to show you uh, the main ones. But yeah, come get involved. It is really, really important. QGS basically works only because of people that get involved in the project. Um, one of the most important thing that we need people to help us out is documenting QGS. So we have an amazing software uh, that, is, uh, that is, has a lot of functionality, so it takes a lot of time to document everything. So if you can give a hand, and, uh, and the great thing here is that you need to be a user and not a programmer. So uh, actually, a lot of people could help out here. Translating, um, QGIS has, uh, as you see in the background, 96 project languages between the documentation, the desktop, the website. Obviously, we cannot take care of everything. We do need the help of everybody. And here is where you can uh, contribute with your, uh, with your language skills. I mentioned before, Stack Exchange is an amazing place to get answers. Well, it needs people to give uh, answers as well. So there is also a really good place to help out and, uh, and give knowledgeable answers to other people that have questions and are struggling. Then we do have uh, enhancement proposals for when we Coming, it's uh, it's really it gets sometimes a bit more technical, but it also needs uh, a user perspective where we we are planning out newer uh, newer bigger uh, features, and and there is a discussion before a feature gets implemented, like Nayal showed before the process to get temporal into QGIS. Obviously, um, QGIS has bugs. The big difference. Uh, is that QGS says that it has bugs and the bugs are public and they are reported by you user and we try to work on them. Uh, so just help out when you do a bug report, uh, when you report an issue, please take care. Uh, it is really important. Do not just write, it does not work. Uh, really do a bit of work on your side as well on telling us how can you reproduce it and try to reduce the problem to, uh, to a very easy way to reproduce that. And, that's the best way to, to tell us what is not working. 
um, obviously, uh, pay for uh, features, hire companies. There are plenty of companies that offer commercial support. They, they do offer um, developing features. And obviously, if you get a feature, remember that you should be paying also for testing that feature and uh, also get those companies to, to work for you for bug fixing. You need something that is really pressing. You need to bug fix it. Get one of the company listed on QGS.org to, to do some work for you. Another way to help the project financially uh, is um, to, to take courses with uh, organizations that are certified by the QGIS uh, certification program, because every certificate that a company issues um, from that platform will give 20 euros back to the project. So it's a really great way to give a bit of, to, to allow training uh, uh, organizations to also sponsor the project. And finally, um, or as first, if you want to get involved more on the money side and less on the time side, just become a sustaining member. We have a great uh, we have a great program where uh, which is still waiting for the first flagship member. So there is a, a really good opportunity there to be the first entity to be up at the top of the list. Um, it only set you back a couple of euros and um you'll you'll be helping out a lot the qgs.org association running all the the grant proposal the the hack the meetings that we hopefully will have soon again uh the inter bug fixing uh, and and all the the running things that we have around um was quick was fast but we have so much uh, content and please go and explore my presentation click on the links and see what uh, what is possible there have a great day everybody and thanks to all the presenters for for helping out thank you very much marco for uh, all this interesting information and i'm sure if people have questions they can directly um, write you as well later on and absolutely uh, yes maybe discuss some points so. yes absolutely thank you So I would like to introduce now um, Mathieu Pellerin, who is a core developer of QGIS for many years as well. He has also figured in some of the slides of Niall, so maybe you have already recognized him. Uh, he's a specialist for Asian uh, character sets and writing schemes, and he is based in Vietnam. So he joins us from very far away today. Uh, so the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? And is yes. the sound quality okay? Acceptable? It is all right. We can still hear, I think, your ventilator. Um, no, but the ventilator no. is off. So it's I don't off. Know. Okay. There but is still some kind of background noise, but we can we can hear you. Okay, super. So uh, one little correction. I am uh, based in uh, Phnom Penh in Cambodia at the moment. Oh, but, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, am on, I am on mainland Southeast Asia. Okay. So, uh, yeah, just a little bit of background uh, uh, on uh, me and my introduction on how I came to use QGIS and, and I'm a developer of and that all connects to this uh, idea of uh, multilingual workflows. So I actually first started using uh, QGIS 15 years ago uh, when I uh, started working in the region because the, uh, the commercial alternatives were not able to properly render uh, complex uh, Southeast Asian scripts like Burmese, Lao, Khmer script. Uh, and QJS was uh, uh, excellent, uh, had an excellent Unicode support from uh, uh, very early on. So I started using QJS as a necessity. And uh, uh, soon afterwards, uh, uh, continued using QJS because it became just a better uh, uh, cartographic product, at least for the needs that I have. And uh, so one of the first commits that I applied to QJS was also related to uh, uh, NDIC, the complex script uh, uh, display. I cannot remember what it was, but so this is how I came to use QJS and how I came to uh, push commits into the, the uh, the, the, the source tree and um, 
So multi-languages has always been something that uh, I've had to deal with, and over the years I've been able, I think, to develop a, 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 a good workflow that hopefully other people can uh, appreciate and make use of uh, in their own uh, workspaces uh, or at home. So the <coughs> pardon me. Why uh, would we want to discuss of uh, um, multi-language workflows and why we want to improve it? So first, the the primary goal here is to avoid what I've seen many, many people doing, which is creating multiple projects uh, for multiple languages uh, for the same maps. Uh, the other pitfall that I've seen uh, very often is one project, uh, but with many duplicated layers uh, that slow down project loading, that creates a messier layer tree structure. So uh, the idea is to create workflows that avoid both of these issues that makes our projects uh, faster and also uh, especially when it comes to maintaining uh, duplicate projects, avoid uh, updating the English language project and forgetting to upload the uh, French project or, or the Vietnamese project or the Thai project uh, alongside. So the foundation of, of uh, the workflow that I'm using, and I'm sure I'm not alone, is very, very simple. It's using a, 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 um, a language variable, which I will share my desktop, and we will start saying. All right, so I am loading QGIS. So the foundation uh, is very simple. You have a language variable. I, I use lang, but uh, obviously the, the variable name is uh, up to uh, the users, where I define which language I'm currently uh, interested in displaying. So right now I have English. And then if I would change uh, this to uh, another language that is predefined, uh, and then I refresh my canvas, uh, uh, the language has switched to Khmer in this case. I only have one project. I only have one set of uh, uh, layers. And I can switch between languages using that variable name. Uh, thanks to uh, QGIS's a variable, uh, the way the variable is set up, uh, it's a cascading system where you have uh, QGIS level variables, project levels, and then it goes down and down. So if you share a project across many users, the, the users can set up their language at the uh, system-wide level. Oh, sorry. And uh, so each user could open the map in his or her own uh, language of choice. So how we actually execute this afterwards uh, is using the language variable. We are able to use labels and change other types of properties using the uh, the variable here. So actually, I can simplify this even more. So if a variable is key m show this field, which is my Khmer version of uh, uh, the label. Otherwise, since I only deal with two languages uh, in this project, show a uh, province name. You could use a, a switch case, uh, lang equal English, uh, then ta 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 ta. So you could have uh, 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 multiple languages here. I will only uh, deal with two languages in the project, but you can deal with three, four, five if you want. Uh, similarly, I also use a data defined property to uh, define the font specifically for uh, each language. So very often, especially when it comes to uh, more complex scripts, uh, 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 you need a specific font or a specific set of fonts to display the language. Uh, so you can actually use these data-defined properties 
to uh, change your font. And so very often the font uh, uh, involves also uh, different metrics. So the size, you might have to vary the size, you might have to vary the line spacing uh, in between the lines. Similarly here, uh, I'm also changing uh, the symbology. So these little uh, numbers that are uh, mar that are marker symbols, I'm changing the font family based on the language. So that is uh, something that, be that can be quite uh, useful. The language variable you can apply uh, pretty much on, on any part of QGIS. And so therefore you can customize the vast majority of your QGIS experience through a project merely by having this one uh, uh, call. And I'm going back. Oh no. So you guys can see my screen. Oh. Mm. Let me see. Okay, okay. So is can it, can people hear me but cannot see my screen or uh, and we tried this morning and everything was fine. Okay. Let me try to share again and uh, I won't quit the window uh, uh, until I have uh, until I have confirmation that you guys can see. Uh, is that working now? Yes, okay. Uh, I see your navigator. All right, so I am going to switch back to QGIS. And can somebody tell me if you see, can I get an audio feedback as to whether you guys are seeing my QGIS application? Uh, uh, okay, okay, now okay, I'm, I get some confirmation that we can see. So I would just, uh, uh, I will con maybe like recap just one second and uh, uh, move on from there. So uh, I have this uh, uh, variable here that we set up, lang uh, uh, with some uh, value, and then you can use the variable to change your label and some properties like font, etc., uh, using a variable. So that uh, allows, that's the foundation uh, with which you can uh, customize your project. Now, I'm going to show you, uh, because uh, we're running a little bit out of time, I'm going to show you a more complex project. Uh, 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 and we can discuss a little bit on uh, each little part of the project. So this is a very dense uh, project with uh, many, many layers. I will switch my language to uh, the alternative language that I have set up in this project. And so as you can see now, uh, uh, my language is uh, Latin English, it's in Khmer. Uh, and then you can see a couple of interesting little uh, uh, hacks here. For example, my decoration on canvas is using the language uh, uh, to either display English or Khmer based on the variable. So uh, this is working a little bit like that. So it's actually an expression that defines uh, uh, whether the the, the very whether the label will be in English or Khmer. Um, if we go back and we remove uh, uh, language, uh, take this one out, please. All right. Um, so to show you another, so this is my. English version of the map here. And then exactly at this, the same project, again, the same project, the same data set. I actually have 
the Khmer version of the map. And that's simply uh, by setting the variable at the, um, at the layout uh, level. So basically, again, this idea that variables can be overwritten as you uh, drill into uh, uh, project and scopes. So my overall uh, language is in English. And for this specific map, I have it in Khmer. Um, another advanced, uh, uh, slightly more advanced, but uh, a very useful uh, trick when you do reviews. So each map uh, canvas that you can uh, add uh, through the addition of map views actually have their own variable scope. So you can actually, you see now I have an English map here and a Khmer map uh, uh, over there. I can synchronize the view, oops, synchronize the view and scale and actually uh, uh, go down and be able to uh, see the project in English and in Khmer. Uh, and I could have as many map views as I have languages uh, set up in my uh, project. And that allows me to do review of uh, both languages simultaneously uh, uh, and, and synchronized with the main canvas, which is uh, uh, quite useful. Um, another trick. Uh, this one is uh, not for everybody, but for people who have languages where, I don't know if you can see, I will try to zoom in as much as I can. So you guys might see these numbers are not uh, Arabic numbers. So you can actually use uh, expressions to override grids. So if I find myself here. So you can customize the format of a grid and then using this replace expression with a predefined map. Okay, so I repla replace the string with a predefined map. So one becomes this, two becomes that, three becomes this. You can actually come up with localized uh, digits in your uh, in your product um, so in mainland southeast asia and other parts of the world it's quite uh, important to be able to uh, uh, come up with uh, local local digits uh, sometimes arabic digits simply don't mean much for uh, for people um, One uh, last thing that I want to show here is actually, let me uh, close this. And so this uh, language variable is not only uh, useful in the context of QGIS, but it's little uh, brother Q field. Uh, also can benefit from that. So I, w I am going to reopen the exact same project that we saw earlier. And then I will go in the setting variables. I will add the variable uh, uh, language QM. And then as I refresh the canvas, I'm now in uh, my non-English language. So again, if you guys have, uh, if you work in in, uh, in groups and uh, not everybody uh, uh, relies on the same language as their primary language, you can have one project and you can set it up so that uh, uh, each individual QGIS uh, uh, or Q field uh, um, user is able to set the language that he or she prefers. And so that's, I've, I've kind of went a little bit deep here, but uh, the, the basic idea is to use this one singular variable 
and, and then you can manipulate uh, uh, everything. Uh, one last uh, <laughs> one last display, uh, uh, which is worth uh, uh, mentioning. Uh, allowing. So I'm hoping that you guys see my screen again. So uh, a last little trick that I would like to share should have just before now. So these this uh, these variables are again they're used everywhere. Now if I do uh, if I try to identify a couple of features here, uh, we can see the title of each uh, feature displays in English. If I switch my language again, uh, sorry, quickly, if I switch my language to Khmer again, I will try to identify. You see now my uh, the display name is in Khmer language. So that's, again, simply using the same uh, foundational stone, this one singular variable. And I'm using the display name, if language is Khmer, uh, display Khmer name, otherwise uh, English. And again, this could be expanded using a switch statement to three, four, five, six different languages. Uh, so that is it for now. It was just a, a, a quick uh, uh, tips and tricks thrown at the audience. If you guys have uh, questions, uh, uh, I might have some time to answer a couple of questions now or uh, later during the day. Thank you very much. Um, especially for this is very important and very interesting. I think Actually, I see a few questions that I would that I can answer now. So um, you could, one thing I did not show, but you could well have one layout sheet with two map items and have one map item with uh, English language and the other one with Khmer uh, or a second or third language. So you can set the variables at, at each map item uh, level, which gives you the possibility of doing uh, multi-language uh, uh, display of maps within one single sheet. Uh, Arnaud was asking, was uh, uh, mentioning that you have to uh, Okay, I think we lost the uh, answer. Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Um. Bon, euh, hi everybody. Uh, je sais pas, je vais parler en français, donc ça va changer justement de language. <laughs> euh, je sais pas, Isabelle, si tu m'as introduit, on n'a pas tout compris. <laughs> euh, du coup, je pense que je vais commencer mon, ma présentation. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Ok, parfait. Alors, euh, je vais partager mon écran. Ok, parfait. Donc, euh, moi, je vais parler des, de QGIS Modeler, des nouveautés euh, à ce sujet. Alors, euh, je m'appelle euh, Lucie Collier, j'ai fait un bachelor en géomatique à l'école d'ingénieurs à Yverdon. Je suis actuellement euh, QGIS experte 
consultante et, et enseignante pour la société euh, OpenG Concierge. Donc, euh, je vais déjà parler de Modeler en général pour les personnes qui n'utilisent pas actuellement ou qui euh, ne connaissent pas forcément. Euh, donc, QGIS Modeler, c'est un, une interface graphique qui permet de créer des, des modèles complexes en utilisant des, des pistes et déposés d'outils et de, de input dans une interface. Donc, en premier, tout en haut de, du Graphic Modeler, il y a divers outils pour ouvrir un modèle existant, pour sauvegarder le modèle, pour sauvegarder le modèle dans euh, le projet QGIS actuel. Euh, personne ne voit mon, mes slides. Je crois que... Non. Euh... Je vais refaire le chain. Cette fois, vous voyez mes slides. Oui, c'est tout. Ok, super. Euh, donc, euh, je reviens aux outils qui sont en haut de, de Graphic Modeler. On a la possibilité d'ouvrir un, un modèle existant, de sauvegarder, sauvegarder dans QGIS, qui peut être euh, Intéressant de pouvoir faire appel à un modèle qu'on vient de créer ou qu'on a créé précédemment. La possibilité de naviguer dans le modèle et puis aussi d'exporter de, ce modèle. Donc là, on voit qu'on a un onglet Input. On peut euh, ajouter euh, des différentes possibilités d'ajout de fichiers et aussi de, de valeurs, comme par exemple les couleurs ou, ou autres. Ensuite, on a l'onglet algorithme, qui sont tous les outils qu'on a accès. Donc, c'est vraiment une quantité énorme de divers outils qui sont développés. Toujours plus, toujours des nouveautés chaque fois qu'il y a une, un upgrade. Et aussi euh, des librairies comme... Euh, comme si vous installez Saga, vous allez avoir des outils euh, dans, accessibles dans cet, dans cet onglet. Donc là, on voit un modèle qui a été créé. On a un input, les Saga en jaune, en blanc, c'est les algorithmes, et puis en vert, c'est les outputs qui sont euh, générés de nos algorithmes. On a aussi la possibilité de, de faire tourner ce, ce modèle en batch, ce qui pro, permet de, par exemple, sélectionner un, un dossier avec plusieurs euh, mêmes styles de fichiers et de faire tourner sur tous les fichiers qu'on a dans ce dossier. Donc là, maintenant, si on revient sur les news, donc, dans QGIS 3.14, depuis vendredi, et euh, dans la LTR qui sera 3.16 en octobre, de, qui va sortir en octobre 2020, on a maintenant la possibilité de faire des copier coller dans ce modeleur. Donc, euh, simplement avec un CTRL-C et CTRL-V, on peut multiplier nos nos divers euh, contenants. On peut aussi manipuler euh, plusieurs contenants en une seule fois grâce à la sélection multiple. C'est aussi possible de faire un copier-coller de, de plusieurs contenants en même temps. On peut faire un retour en arrière en avant. Donc 
Donc ça, tous ces outils nous permettent de faciliter euh, le, le travail sur Moodle. Donc là, on a la possibilité de, de redimensionner notre contenant euh, qui nous permet de, si on a un, un, un nom qui est plus grand que la taille euh, initiale, c'est d'avoir une meilleure lisibilité de notre modèle. On peut ajouter un commentaire. Par exemple, si vous avez fait le choix d'utiliser un algorithme plutôt qu'un autre, vous pouvez ajouter là le commentaire euh, qui dit pourquoi vous avez choisi celui-là plutôt qu'un autre. Donc, quand vous revenez sur un, un modèle, c'est toujours euh, pratique de pouvoir savoir pourquoi vous avez fait d'une façon ou d'une autre. Puis là, on voit qu'on peut ajouter hein, une couleur de fond au commentaire. On peut créer des, des box. Euh, donc là, si on crée des box, on peut mettre un titre à la box. On peut aussi changer le, la couleur de fond. Ceci va permettre de, de naviguer après dans, dans, notre, dans notre modèle. Donc là, j'ai mis euh, une box en entrée, une box en sortie. Si on zoome dans le modèle, ensuite on va dans les vues, on peut aller zoomer sur le GPX ou la sortie. Donc si vous avez un vraiment grand modèle, eh ben, c'est toujours pratique de pouvoir, euh, de pouvoir naviguer dedans, d'avoir cette possibilité. Donc, il y a aussi, euh, pour faire un peu d'ordre dans, dans un modèle, on peut maintenant se snapper sur une grille. Voilà. Donc, maintenant, on a des nouveaux algorithmes, le conditional branch, qui permet de justement donner des conditions à une branche et de créer plusieurs branches. Donc là, j'ai créé une branche qui s'appelle « will be true » si c'est « true » et « will be false » si c'est « false ». Donc là, maintenant, on voit qu'on a notre algorithme et puis un out, « output » qui est euh, « will be true » et « will be false ». Maintenant, si, dans l'exemple, si vous, faites, vous créez quelque chose, souvent, ben, vous allez dire ben, « si c'est true, je veux que ça aille plus loin dans mon dans mon script et puis si c'est faux, je vais raising un warning, ça veut dire que s'il y a quelque chose qui passe là-dedans, dans notre log, ça va, ça va écrire the branch is resulting false et je vais choisir la dépendance qui est euh, celle que je viens de créer, la condition will be false de, de mon algorithme euh, conditional branch. Donc là, on voit comment ça donne les connexions. Donc, autre news dans, dans QGIS 3.14 euh, que je n'ai pas illustré, il y, a la il y a le modèle qui se rappelle de ce que vous avez mis comme input quand vous êtes en train de tester le modèle. Comme ça, il n'y a pas besoin de chaque fois réintroduire euh, ce que vous êtes en train de tester. Il y a la possibilité de déconnecter des composants, euh, de, de créer des exceptions à votre modèle et puis aussi de, euh, de réordrer vos inputs. Donc depuis la QGIS 3.6, il y a aussi la possibilité d'exporter votre script en format Python. Ce qui peut être intéressant si vous voulez aller plus loin dans, votre, euh, dans le modèle et aussi la possibilité, ben, si vous voulez écrire un script Python et que, par exemple, vous ne savez pas comment l'algorithme euh, doit être écrit ou avec quels paramètres, etc. Dans 
QGIS 3.14. Maintenant, il y a la possibilité de faire tourner des algorithmes sans euh, ouvrir QGIS. Donc, c'est avec euh, QGIS Process en ligne de commande. Euh, avec le premier, ça nous montre euh, la liste des algorithmes disponibles par ce biais. Avec le deuxième, ça nous montre euh, la liste des plugins qui sont disponibles. Et le troisième, ça nous donne l'aide d'un algorithme ou d'un plugin. Donc là, j'ai mis un exemple. Euh, donc, euh, vous mettez QGIS Process, Run, et puis après là, par exemple, l'exemple le, est fait avec un buffer. Donc, on doit mettre le paramètre euh, d'entrée, input, euh, la distance de notre buffer, et puis l'output, tout ce qu'on veut qu'il qu soit écrit. Ça. Euh, il y a aussi la possibilité de faire tourner euh, un modèle. Donc, euh, le modèle point modèle 3. Donc là aussi, il faut mettre les paramètres et puis c'est un peu le, la, la même procédure que vu précédemment. Donc en synthèse, euh, depuis le QGIS 3.6, on a la possibilité d'exporter euh, nos scripts en format Python et depuis la 3.14, donc depuis vendredi, on a la possibilité de faire tourner des des algorithmes sans, euh, de quoi, processing, sans ouvrir QGIS. Et puis aussi, de, on a beaucoup d'améliorations dans le modèle designer pour euh, créer nos nouveaux, nouveaux modèles. Merci pour votre attention. Alors, si vous avez des questions, euh, je, je suis là aussi. Merci beaucoup, Lucie. Um, I think you can still not hear me, maybe, or it's better. Okay, it seems better than before. Um, thank you very much, Lucie, for this presentation. Um, I didn't really introduce you because I had these audio problems uh, before, so Lucy is a geomatics engineer at OpenGIS.ch, as, as she said at the beginning. Uh, she was also formerly working for the city of Marge and was giving classes on GIS, so she's really, uh, she really knows the geo industry and the practical applications of QGIS. Thank you very much um, for having taken the time uh, to present you this. Uh, I think there wasn't any specific question for you Um, so I would suggest that um, we will take a, a short break now. Um, so normally, normally there's also Hans Jörg joining us again. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, I announce you that uh, we will have a break as as um, as planned. Uh, until 11.05, so uh, don't hesitate to walk a bit, uh, have a coffee and, and take a deep breath before we continue at 11.05. And Andreas has pre prepared some uh, polls, uh, so the ones that I was talking uh, about before, so now you should normally be able to see them, so you can um, take a bit of time maybe also to answer these uh, questions during the break. Thank you very much. See you in 15 minutes.
Hello, hello. I can't hear anybody or anything. Can I present my screen as well? So
presentation is in five minutes. Okay, two more minutes and uh, we will resume the webinar. Okay, are we ready to resume? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I... Okay, we'll just uh, wait maybe uh, one more minute. I'm getting a server error. Uh -huh. Yana server is uh, down. Okay. Um, can you reload the screen? The, no, uh, the the screen sharing. Like, I oh, know you cannot access. 
Um, I can stop sharing and... Uh, yeah, try that, please. Okay. Still... Uh, still the same? Yeah. yeah. Um, Yeah, I guess I have to re deactivate you as a moderator and then reactivate. So you can reload the page just uh, one second and please try again. Okay. 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 Is it working now? Yeah, it is working. Okay. okay perfect. Uh, brilliant. Can you all see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Apparently, the others can see it. I cannot, but. As okay. I start with uh, the presentation. I have a presentation, a couple of slides for introducing you to uh, Mesh Layer, and then uh, some demos. Uh, I'll monitor the chat if there is any hiccup. Uh, let me know. Okay. Uh, about us, we are Lutra Consulting, a core QGIS developer, and in addition to that, we have some uh, projects and products will complement QGIS, uh, like mobile app for based on QGIS, which is input, data synchronization, and uh, web mapping platform. And um, I directly dive into Mesh. What is Mesh? Uh, we are all familiar with the normal formats we deal day-to-day -day in GIS, vector data, which uh, consists of uh, a geometry and a database. And then uh, we have also mm, rasters, which is... Uh, pixels plus value or values uh, that's that pixel is square shaped uh, and uh, you can have stack of values on top of each other but then uh, how do you handle data which are not in regular format and it's halfway between raster and vector and uh, it can consist of other data sets uh, examples of it uh, like teens or uh, uh, meteorological data where you have got extra quantities at the um, uh, nodes or edges. Um, so uh, for these kind of things, we uh, uh, in the past, the usual method was to represent those as uh, raster or vector. And the way it was, uh, they were represented either through uh, gridded data, some gridding and then uh, translate it to a normal uh, uh, square-based rasters or using uh, contouring, for example, for uh, representing them as vector. But usually by doing that, uh, we introduce uh, a level of um, interpolation within the data, which uh, in some cases make the data even uh, invalid. If you think of, for example, uh, meteorological uh, data, this kind of interpolation can uh, make uh, a whole uh, uh, province rain or not rain uh, based on the forecast or uh, if it's a flood model data, if your property is going to be flooded or not. So instead of uh, um, the interpolation, we decided to introduce a new data provider which uh, handles the data as, as they are and avoid this kind of uh, interpolations. Um, uh, this uh, mesh data, or, uh, we introduced a library called MDAL, and uh, with that you could uh, represent data on uh, cells or faces or edges. The data can have time dimension, as earlier this morning uh, Nal was mentioning, and you can have quantities and vector data for mesh, and uh, Similar to raster, you can stack up multiple data and have different quantities within one data set. 
uh, and the aim was to really have a new library to similar to OGR or GDA, which handles your vector and raster, have a, an, another one which handles your mesh data. So I'll start with the uh, basic one. Um, this is how you load a mesh data in QGIS. If you uh, go to uh, browser, let me check, see first of all, you can all see my screen and uh, yeah. Uh, so you can see my screen, yeah? I hope. Okay. Um, here is a mesh data uh, from meteorological data. You can download this kind of data either from NASA or from ECMWF. And then once you add it to QGIS, you have got uh, here a panel where uh, you see different quantities. Uh, uh, and uh, if your mesh is temporal, which it is, you can see it here, uh, you can enable the temporal component and uh, browse through the um, values. In this example, it's for whole August uh, uh, 2007, uh, September 2017, and you can see by moving the time slider, the mesh gets uh, uh, refreshed. The uh, data um, can also have vector component. For example, here, if I turn on the vector data, you will see the velocity for the wind. Uh, and uh, um, there are many ways of styling the data. Let's say you want to uh, style the precipitation. You can click on that and uh, activate uh, the precipitation quantity, go to uh, uh, the styling panel and uh, let's uh, create a new color ramp based on precipitation. Hmm. Uh, precipitation, these are the color ramps coming with QGIS. So if I select this, uh, and probably make zero a bit more transparent. Uh, you will be able to see the precipitation. I turn off the velocities for the time being. And as you can move the slider, you can see the evolution of rain over Florida. Okay, uh, let's uh, look at the styling of uh, vectors as well. You can represent vectors. And here the default value is um, uh, our arrows. Uh, you can change the spacing of them, like 10 pixel by 10 pixel to make it a bit more uh, readable. Also, you can uh, change uh, the um, styling to streamlines or traces. Uh, uh, so these are the traces of wind. You can also apply a color ramp to uh, uh, your... Um, uh, quite. So the again, by changing that, you will be able to see the streamlines changing based on the velocity. So that's uh, one type of data. These are meteorological data, and uh, the mesh is 2D. Uh, you have got uh, those quantities. Uh, but also with mesh, you can have... Uh, um, something called two and a half D mesh. Two and a half D mesh is uh, uh, stacked data that, uh, if you think of, for example, temperature or uh, let's say uh, salinity of water, uh, you can have different levels or depth where you have got different values. So the topology of mesh remains the same, but the quantities over it will change. 
and uh, that has been added to QGIS as well. Let's go to 3D data. So this is uh, temperature data somewhere in uh, Brisbane, and uh, you can um, uh, see different. Uh, there is an extra tab. That's the 3D uh, uh, sampling of the mesh. You can uh, change the way you want to see averaging over the depth because we don't support the 3D stack, a two and a half D stack mesh. The only way um, to see it is in 2D view and we can do uh, some sort of uh, averaging over different depth uh, to be able to see that. Uh, another good way of visualizing that is probably through a uh, plot so we can drill down and see the variation of the, uh, uh, for example, in this case, uh, temperature or salinity, this temperature, uh, 2D plot, 3D plot, and then uh, layer uh, current time peak from map. So when you click on the map, you can see the temperature is changing from 21.23 all the way to 21.3.8. That's the surface of the water and that's the bottom and you can see the depth uh, of the uh, water here and the variation and as you move the uh, time slider you can see the change in the temperature here as well. Uh, uh, this mesh is uh, quite complex. You can see it's uh, uh, adaptive mesh and uh, unlike the previous one, you have got irregular shapes here as well. Um, another type of mesh that uh, you can have is um, uh, 1D mesh. 1D mesh is when you store data in, on edges. Uh, examples of that are uh, uh, like a pipe uh, network, uh, urban drainage network. Uh, in this uh, way, um, you can uh, represent, for example, flow or velocity inside those. See, I made them a bit more uh, using the color ramp. Uh, here, um, you can have either a fixed uh, width um, and then varying color, or you can have vari varying color uh, and varying width. So for example, if the pressure in the pipe increases, you can see, uh, oh God, not a good choice of background map, let me turn it off. Uh, so you can see uh, the, uh, The, uh, the width of the pipe changes based on the quantities it, you have within the pipe. Uh, and another way to visualize the data is also to create a long plot. Uh, to do that, you can uh, use, again, crayfish 1D plot. And uh, let's say you want a longitudinal plot from uh, uh, here to here, and you can see the uh, depth in uh, water level in this case. And again, if you move the uh, time slider, you can see the variation of uh, water level within the uh, pipes for this orange bit. So this is uh, 1D, 2D, and 2.5D. And uh, meshes. These are when the quantities of data, uh, the quantities are with, um, uh, have different dimensions. But also you can visualize the data in 3D. So um, in this example, I have uh, mesh data and I can uh, configure the uh, canvas to use uh, mesh as my uh, uh, top, uh, topography for the 3D terrain, and then uh, the elevation comes from mesh. You can apply exaggeration and uh, add some color ramp and change the light, uh, and you will get a view like this. 
and you can go to uh, uh, 2D uh, quantities you want to overlay on the mesh. In this case, I want to apply, for example, flood depth and uh, 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 adjust the uh, Z values to be relative to the mesh. So it auto, auto scales the, the uh, depth to fit in nicely with the topography. And then you can move the time slider and see the evolution of the, let me change the view to somewhere probably a bit more up somewhere here. So if I move the time slider, you can see the flood in 3D scene. So these are uh, the progress all the way up to QGIS 3.14. Uh, what we would like to add in the uh, future uh, release of QGIS, uh, uh, it's memory layer for mesh. So you can do similar things with raster or vector that you have a memory layer, temporary layer, uh, we would like to also add the expressions and some mesh conversion tools between uh, raster and vector to a mesh. Uh, labeling, it's not confirmed and optimization of large data is not confirmed. We uh, also would like to add uh, 3D texturing of uh, data on top of the mesh. So for example, if you have aerial photography, you could overlay that on top of the terrain. So. These are the features we are hoping to add in uh, future releases of QGIS. I think that's my presentation. I don't know if I've overrun it or... No, oh, it's perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Saber. It was very nice. Uh, it was also interesting to see this practical case of, of uh, hydrology data. And this is also a good bridge to the next um, presenter who is um, concentrating more on geology. So um, Vincent Mora is joining us from um, the French company uh, Oslandia. So he's a senior developer and engineer for QGIS, Python, C++, and probably a lot of other uh, specialties. He's also in the core development and the community management of uh, QGIS. And uh, he has touched many different applications of QGIS. So he will talk about uh, geological suite of uh, QGIS today. Thanks for being here. And thanks again, Saber, for your presentation. No problem at all. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Sorry for no video. It's uh, no problem. Uh, Isabel, I don't see yes. the... I will just uh, give you yours. So should be able to see it now. Great. Thank you. Good morning, um, and thank you for attending this talk. Uh, I've been working at Oslandia for the past seven years, and, uh, and we provide services on, on open source GIS architectures. Um, among the services is the, is the development of, of QGIS plugins for, uh, for customer specific needs. Uh, we try to make them publicly available uh, when the need is not that specific, and they may, they may be useful for, for others. And also try to to when when the need happens to be uh, generic and not specific to to contribute to core. Um, in in this talk, I will try and illustrate uh, the the interest of the geological community for QGIS. Um, I'll give another view of four plugins that have been developed in the in the ge geological field. Um, a few words about the company uh, who finance and, and the institutions uh, who finance the, the, those developments. Um, give a few words about the, the context, so so the um, the, the work, uh, the the, um, the field where the, those plugins are useful. Uh, they range. Uh, from field data acquisition to simulation result uh, visualization, so so related to, to what Saber just presented. Um, 
And, and one of them is of particular interest because uh, it was needed for all uh, other projects. So all of the pro plugins, and this is QGeologist. Uh, let's start with um, OpenStope. Uh, the, the stop is the, the open space that is left after underground mining has taken place. So geologists go in the gallery and they draw the wall. They, they record the, the type of rock, the color, the presence and type of organic matter, uh, the state of oxidation uh, and so on and so forth. Um, it used to be done on papers and newspaper used to lie uh, in boxes. Uh, although it's precious data if they are made available into a, a, an information system. So the idea of the plugin um, is to, uh, to replace uh, the paper uh, and to allow to draw uh, on the field and store the data and, and reconstruct uh, the volume of the reconstruct an underground modeling for, from, those, uh, from those drawings. Uh, so this is a plugin that is based on QGIS. This is a QGIS uh, canvas with QGIS layer, except that they are, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of standalone. So the graphical user interface of QGIS is not, uh, is not uh, launched. Uh, it's meant to mimic the original paper form to lower the resistance to change. And um, the position is actually coded uh, on, on the top uh, left corner of the, um, of the form, so this is how it's uh, it's it's localized. The geologists concretely draw lines. Uh, then he, he had points, and and the points uh, hold the attributes of the of the of the polygon that are defined by the, by the lines that are the boundaries. Uh, the geometries are saved in a, in a PostgreSQL database, and and through a view. Uh, the, the the lines are trained, extend automatically, and uh, and, and and the view uh, uh, show the, the the polygons that are uh, that are defined by the lines. The baseline of the drawing uh, is for for which we have a, a reference uh, code on the on the top left uh, is actually a three D line string, and. Uh, with this data, uh, we can uh, we can reconstruct difficult to switch slides. We can reconstruct three uh, D volumes. So what you see on the on the map canvas on the top is the the blueprint of the mine. The the little red lines are the baseline of the walls that we are making the drawing on. Uh, and and on the bottom you see a, a short a small widget uh, for for three D visualization because the, uh, this happened to be developed before three D was available uh, in in the course of it's uh, it's a ad hoc three D visualization plugin. Uh, this plugin has been developed for uh, Arriva that uh, has now become Orano Mining and it's uh, it's a mining company that specializes in uh, uranium uh, ore uh, for the nuclear industry. Um, they also uh, needed uh, a tool uh, for the open mining field. So now we are not in galleries, but in, a, in an open field. And this is a control card. So it's, it's also a, a field application. So the, the, the operator that you see on the, on the, on the picture uh, is holding a, a, a a reinforced uh, tablet on, on which QGIS is running with a, a slightly simplified uh, interface. So he can, uh, he can concentrate on, on the job because he is surrounded by, by mining, uh, mining trucks. Uh, the, the terrain is modeled using cubits, so it, those are flat bricks or, or we call them slabs. Uh, they are five meter wide and alpha meter, meter thick. Uh, and what you see on the on, on the canvas or or the the brick that are not yet been removed, so the the operator directs the the mining loaders to load the slabs in trucks. So the a, a truck typically fits two slabs, 
and then he, he marks the on the on the QGS enterprise that that the that the slab has been removed. So the the slab uh, disappears. So the color uh, tells you if the the slab has uh, has uh, hole in it or or is uh, is just dirt. The the one that contains uh, uranium ore, they, they go to the treatment plants. The the slab that don't contain ore, they, they go to tailings or the mine dumps. Uh, and the trucks take a detour uh, for the moment to a measurement station to determine the, the ore concentration. So the, the one that you see on display is the one that was forecast, uh, modeled prior to, to, to the mining. Uh, and they do actual measurement uh, and, and trucks make a detour for that. And to avoid the need for this, this measurement station, um, the operator now, and, and this is the, the, the main aim of the project, uh, he has a, a, a stick in his hand that has a differential GPS that is integrated into QGIS, um, and it reco it records the also the, the radiometry uh, when the operator is is moving on the on the field. So the radiometry is acquired uh, at uh, uh, on the on on the field and prior to to the loading of the truck. So. What the, the, at the moment the, the process is um, uh, is uh, entering the, the validation phase and measure from the stick they are compared with the measure from the the station that they still have um, and there there is the the desktop application that allows to to compare the 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 measured uh, value from the field to the measure value from the uh, from the measurement station. Um, now let's leave uh, uranium production and, and move to another project. And this project is about uh, nuclear power plants um, and about the safety. So the, the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, the French CEA, uh, is among many things the, responsible for the safety of the power plants. And we have a several collaborate, a year collaboration with them. Mm, uh, Theresis is, uh, is a piece of software that simulates uh, what would happen if pollutants were spilled on the ground. So on the left panel, uh, um, you see the, 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 it's integrated into QGIS. So on the left panel, you see a, a simplified interface. In case of, uh, of, uh, of crisis, uh, we don't want too much clutter to, to, to make the simulation and take the, the appropriate measures. Um, you can choose the, the site uh, where the, the chemicals are, are spilled uh, as a geometry uh, and the, the, the globally the, the site where it happens. So the, the, the models are predefined. So when you choose a site, it will zoom in the, the appropriate zone uh, and the simulation period. So firstly, a, a 1D simulation uh, is performed to 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 see how the pollutants they, they travel from the ground to the to the aquifer, and then a two T simulation takes place. The, it takes the the input as the at the bottom of the of the, the infiltration column, uh, and transfer it to the the aquifer and and make a two D simulation of the transport of pollutants in the in the aquifer. It's the the result you see on the on the map. Uh, if you see blue in the in in the column on, on the on the right panel, it's because uh, at, at this time step, the pollutant is already uh, in the in the aquifer and, and has, has traveled through the ground. There's also a, a 3D widget uh, to 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 see uh, those, those simulation results. So QGS is uh, is used in this case both for uh, pre and and post processing. So those are the same result, but in a, in a in a in a small 3D view. Um, we don't use mesh uh, capabilities because the the, the Plugin is a lot older than that, so th this is a, a plugin that is called Mesh Layer uh, that uh, allows uh, to to display uh, mesh and, and do animation, take into account the, the temporal analysis. So it is nice perspective from the simulation from this morning from Nile and and, 
and just the previous one to 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 see that uh, a lot of this will now be obsoleted and and we can use standard QGIS feature to do that. Next one uh, is Albion. So it's another project we've uh, we carried out with uh, Orano Mining, and it's the first project we uh, we did with them. Uh, so it aims to model the underground in, in general, and uh, in particular the, the uranium ore formation uh, in the underground. Um, this is meant to study uh, potential mining sites and and to study them holes or drilled at regular intervals, interval, uh, and data are collected along the hole. Uh, data is typically the, the the type of rocks, the resistivity, the radiometry. Uh, and a couple of other things. <clears throat> so on the bottom left panel uh, is QGeologist that will uh, uh, present uh, after in more detail. Um, and it displays data from those drill holes that you can see on the on the map canvas. Uh, take it, pay attention to, to the horizontal and, and vertical lines that you see on the side of the, of the display. Um, they are used to project uh, vertical data and to, to display them on the map uh, using uh, QGIS symbol G to, to, to have a section of the, terra, in the, the terrain. So the projection operation is, is done in the database and the, the, the results are, are simply uh, uh, presented in QGIS. And so this is uh, on those sections that you see here. So you, you see uh, on the on the map overview on the on the top uh, on the top left uh, you see the yellow line uh, that is the, the the current section that you are viewing in the in the main map window so be below those uh, those uh, section directions and what will do the geologist is, is that it will connect uh, um, formations that you see like the, the vertical little green lines uh, it will connect them from one hole uh, to to the other. Uh, once you you connect uh, those, uh, you correlate uh, those formations that are found in the holes. Uh, you can you can construct polygons, um, and uh, and from those uh, those polygons. Once you have connected everything in the in the in the field, you, you can reconstruct the, the 3D volumes. This is also done in the database and rendered in, a, in an ad hoc 3D uh, 3D plugin. <clears throat> um, and the, the the as you can see, the the volume that are obtained are, are, uh, are relatively complex shapes. The plugin allows to create a model in in days uh, and where where months were were needed before. So for the four plugins I, I just presented, uh, there is one common need, and that is to display data from drill holes uh, that you can you can see here, and and it was identified uh, early because it has been a long time uh, we uh, we have been uh, working with uh, with geologists. <clears throat> uh, the need for uh, for viewing uh, well logs. Uh, there is also a, we, a, a, a plugin that I didn't talk about. It, it was uh, the GML application Chima toolbox uh, that was financed by the French uh, Geological Survey Institute, like the BRGM, and it's another example where the the log view was needed. So Hugo Merci and I. Um, we coded something like three or four uh, ad hoc uh, log viewers for each project before deciding to go for something uh, that that could be used uh, uh, that's more general and could be used in the, in the, all the different projects. And it, it was also identified as a, as a sort of first step uh, for collaboration between those two big actors uh, of geology in, in France uh, somewhat, some, somewhere uh, three years ago. Uh, and, and why it took so long? It's because data standard in geology, they are like standard in other field, fields, they, they, there is a lot of them. So, so making convergence, uh, um, it, it takes time. 
a few words about the design. Um, basically, a log view is like your usual plot, uh, like a curve bar, bar diagram. It's just rotated 90 degrees to have the, the abscise, the, the axis that is vertical because the abscise is C. Um, well, but we already have matplotlib for general graph and even a, a nice plugin for plotting that is, uh, that is dataplotly in QGIS. Um, but the issue uh, is the, the symbology configuration, like making symbology uh, configuration uh, graphical user interfaces. Uh, it's a huge pain. It's a lot of code. And we already have them in QGIS to configure line width, color pattern, and, and so much more. Uh, so we, we decided to, to use a canvas as the base uh, and just transform the, the, the plot data uh, into QGIS geometry and use QGIS canvas uh, for rendering. So all we, we, it's completely um, uh, integrated and, and, and takes advantage of all the, 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 the the, the symbology power of, of QGS. Uh, on top of that, QG, uh, the, the, the plugin only needs two layers, uh, one layers uh, of points that define the, the, the drill holes for, for the user to pick from, um, and the table and, and any number of table of log data. Uh, and, and the, the, <clears throat> the constraint is that it has uh, one or two columns, either uh, a depth uh, attribute uh, or a to and from, so to death that that uh, mark the start and the and the, the end of the of the feature. And uh, of course, for for each feature in in, in this data, uh, the, the the reference to the to the drill hole it belongs to. Uh, what it looks like. So here you see two selected holes and. Uh, Yes, no, no much time, but I'm nearly finished. Um, so you see uh, stratigraphy um, and uh, the, uh, the the user clicks on uh, selects with uh, uh, QGIS uh, selection tools the 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 drill holes uh, location and then clicks on the on the QGIS bu bu button and and the, the panels reflect. So you see. If, um, uh, stratigraphy and fracturation on this one. Uh, nowadays, we also take pictures uh, in the hole, so it can display pictures. Uh, here you have the force and and uh, that are applied on the on the on the drill that are also displayed um, as they are measured. Uh, it can also uh, do temporal data, but it's it's maybe not be the the, the best use for it. And where we are. Uh, Aiming at so the, the thing we want to add is the ability to add a, a second render uh, a, a second data value in the column so a second layer uh, so we can mask this is some representation you current you you often see uh, in Georgia software uh, the possibility to select uh, holes with sections and the integration to uh, QGIS layout to to uh, to to make prints I think I will stop there. Since I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting to see how how powerful uh, QGIS can be, also for like a very specific applications. And it was it was a very nice presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, as far as I see in the chat, there is no uh, specific question, but um, I guess you are also open if someone wants to write you later on. So now I would like to welcome um, Klaus Carlson, uh, who has done many blog posts and tutorials uh, on YouTube uh, about QGIS. So he has been sharing um, a lot of tips and tricks on many different use cases. And he enjoys um, pushing the QGIS cartography and labeling to, to its limits. And he joins us from Sweden today, so thank, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Vincent, for your presentation, and welcome, Klaas, for, for the next one. So can you hear me all, all right? Yes. OK. Uh, all my presentation will be inside QGIS, so I will try and start my screen sharing.
that look okay? I don't hear anyone complaining and I don't see the chat anymore. So hopefully that is okay. Uh, my name is Klaus Karlsson and uh, I do work with GIS professionally, but all my public QGIS work is uh, purely um, as a hobby. Uh, I do write, as you mentioned, a blog in Swedish, and I also publish the occasional YouTube video. Um, among you, there are a lot of QGIS users. There are some QGIS developers, uh, and I consider myself to be more of a QGIS tinkerer. And uh, I will try to show what I tinker with in this presentation. It is not a tutorial, uh, so it's more like a fast demonstration of what you can achieve with QGIS. Um, it will be some tips and tricks on how you can tinker with QGIS outside the box, uh, because QGIS is extremely powerful when it comes to symbology and uh, styling, uh, but its real superpower comes from uh, combining all of those uh, options for styling. And uh, hopefully I will give you a few examples of this during my presentation. Uh, first, I would like to say something about labeling uh, because labels are a bit tricky since uh, unless you render your map or you print it, uh, you are depending on that the user are uh, have, have access to the same uh, fonts that you are using. Uh, and that's unfortunate because the easiest way to change uh, a label is by changing the font. And uh, that can change the styling a lot. Uh, and with labels as well as styling, there are a lot of options for it. Uh, one of my favorites, and you will see me do this a lot of times during this presentation, is just to remove blur. Turn it to zero. And in this case, I will add some scaling. And maybe also decrease the letter spacing. And suddenly you get a completely different impression of uh, your labels. Uh, but back to object styling. So the simple markers in QGIS are not that simple. They, they are quite powerful in themselves. And you can do this with uh, fill colors. You can do line styles and more. Uh, you can also use the draw effects. You can uh, work with the layer rendering with blending modes. And if you have a more complex style, you can use the symbol levels uh, as well. Uh, and simple marker is just one of nine uh, styling options that you have in QGIS right now. So I will try to make a simple example by using a ellipse marker instead. Uh, and if I combine that with a simple marker, we have a very rudimentary eye. Uh, but to give it a bit more definition, I will add some draw effects with an inner shadow, change direction, and of course, remove the blur, and instead add some transparency. And suddenly, in my mind, we have a much more interesting uh, symbol. Uh, if you want to create some individuality to the eye, you can play with uh, data-defined overrides for the pupil. And uh, in this case, I do that by manipulating the offset with an expression, uh, just creating an array with two random values, one for the X offset and one for the Y offset. And that will generate some individuality. 
and uh, the settings you use uh, guide how much the difference is between them. Uh, you could do some uh, animation of this as well by uh, refreshing the layer in the layer settings. And uh, if you like googly eyes, you can do this really extreme. I'm not sure when your world would use that. Let's look at lines. Uh, lines have uh, also simple settings, and uh, they are all you can also use them to create simple styles. But my tip here is that don't go for the perfect solution directly, uh, try some extremes. So go really extreme with the settings and see what happens. And maybe you can find something that looks interesting uh, and then you can dial it back again. So uh, work with uh, the settings and experiment. And remember you have draw effects and you can work with, uh, for instance, symbol levels to make an interesting style by combining them. But that is still quite a simple way to style things. Let me see like that. My favorite, one of my favorite styling options are the ge geometry generator. And uh, here I am just using a smooth function. Uh, and the smooth function have an option for smoothness. So when I change this value or increase it, the line will become smoother. Uh, but that is not my main interest in this uh, because what it also does is that it creates more vertices. So as I increase smoothness, the vertices also increase. But it doesn't do that uniformly. It's denser at some parts and more sparse at other parts. And that I can work with. So let me change to another geometry generator. Turn this line off. So here I have another geometry generator with a lot of smoothness. Uh, but instead of drawing a really smooth line, I feed that geometry with those dense vertices to another geometry generator. And here I take each vertex and randomize the offset for it. And then I connect it back together. And that gives me a really chaotic line like this. And if I use a dotted marker line instead, that in itself may not be that impressive, but something happens when I zoom out. That to me is a lot more interesting. So this styling comes from maybe combining things in an unorthodox way. Let me change the magnification and let's talk about polygons. Uh, polygons have even more complex geometries. Um, and that gives you even more options. And uh, you can, of course, use a stroke style with a pen, uh, with a, a single simple fill style. Uh, 
but for some cases that don't work. So you can also separate the line in a style layer of its own, but it's still a line. Uh, and really interesting things start to happen when you change it to a marker line. And here I use a really, really dense marker line. So it will look the same as the simple line, more or less. But the interesting part comes when you start to manipulate the simple markers. And in this case, I will be looking at the uh, offset. So of course you could offset by the Y, but I will do that later. Right now, it just highlights a problem for me because the polygons are drawn in different direction. Uh, but in this case, I'm more interested in the offset on the X axis. Uh, because something interesting happens when you start to modify it. I'm not sure if you see it, but look at the corners on the polygons. Uh, and the illusion goes away if you take it to the extreme. So you need to be subtle with this. But there are interesting things happen here. Then if I take the marker line and feed it through a geometry generator, I can turn all geometries in the same direction. So here, if I modify the Y offset, they are all working in the same direction. Uh, here I can also do a data defined override for the offset. Uh, I create a simple array. I do not offset on the X axis and I put in a random number for the Y. Uh, and that will distribute the points uh, in th this direction. I don't find this that interesting. So instead, I use another expression. Uh, still a random number for uh, offset on the y-axis, but I scale it exponentially uh, with a quite high scaling number. And that will concentrate the points along the border and uh, thin them out inward. Uh, and this is an example of what you could call a pencil style. So you can also use the geometry generator to add highlights to your uh, uh, polygons. Uh, in this case, let me just activate it. Oops, there we go. In this case, I... Uh, do a buffer with a negative number. I smooth it, I translate it, and that is just moving it in uh, a certain direction. And uh, then I do an intersect, which cuts everything that sticks out outside my original polygon. And that can be used as a shading effect in a polygon. Uh, I will give you another example of shading effects just in a minute. Uh, you can also use the geometry generator to create really new geometries. So here I have the smooth function again. Uh, I can add this uh, shading effect, but this time with a draw effect. The inner shadow again. And of course, I will remove blur, add transparency. And there I have a shading effect that is that more follows the generated geometry. 
Uh, I may want to create a highlight, and I can do that by buffering again, simplifying and smoothing. And that will give me a form of highlight. To add an outline to this, I could do a simple outline, uh, but what's the fun in that? So instead, I use another geometry generator, uh, a buffer in the positive direction this time. Uh, I do this because I don't want it to be a uniform thickness. So I can use draw effects. And instead of source, I can transform it. And uh, you need to balance the values here with the buffer distance. So in my case, five map units should be fine. And there we have something even more interesting. And you can keep going uh, this way and adding uh, more and more styling and combining it uh, in a way that gives you uh, a lot more options when it comes to styling. So that is all I wanted to show you. Uh, if you have the time when you are creating your maps, uh, experiment. Try all the settings. Other settings you don't know what they do. Try them. Uh, exaggerate. Uh, go beyond what is normal to try to find the nuances that you can dial back and then use in a really productive way. And uh, combined effects and styling is the Kyugi's superpower. Uh, and I've not quite seen that in other software. So this is really powerful in uh, Kyugi's styling. Um, and I think I'll stop there. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. I think your presentation was much appreciated and it was very uh, surprising to see how creative you can really be with all this kind of um, labeling parameters. Um, I think there, we should uh, launch an art uh, competition or something like that <laughs> um, to push this really uh, forward. There was a question. Um, do you have some kind of tutorial how to start with these effects? Uh, not one that comes to mind. I uh, Generally, when I find something that I think is interesting and worthy to share, I, I do that through my... Uh, my uh, social media with the YouTube okay. or Twitter and so on. So uh, I have a lot of videos and a lot of blog posts uh, and most of uh, my findings are there, but I, I, I can't uh, point you to a specific uh, area uh, for this. I'm sorry for that. Okay. Yeah, no, I know where it's, I think uh, um, the interested uh, people should definitely go to your channel and have a look about that. Thank you very much again. And um, yeah, <laughs> keep on uh, creating nice stuff. Oh, I will. <laughs> okay, no, now I would like to introduce uh, Martin Dobias, uh, who is a CTO of Lutra Consulting. He is also a core developer for QGIS and uh, initiator of many uh, modules in QGIS, including sophisticated labeling as well. Uh, second generation symbology, 3D, um, and many more. Uh, he lives and works in Slovakia, if I got that right. And he will talk about um, uh, native support for vector tiles and QJS. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, shall we wait for the 12th then, or? Shall we start? No, I think we can start so you can take a bit more time if you would like to. All right. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah, it's all good. Excellent. So uh, hi, everyone. Let's talk about uh, vector tiles and QGIS. 
So a uh, little bit about me. I work for Ultra Consulting. We are a small company based in UK. We do uh, software development uh, in open source GIS, mainly QGIS um, and all the related services around that. We have also some uh, products, but uh, uh, let's dive into uh, vector tiles. First of all, let me talk about uh, tiled map data in general uh, so that we are all on the same page. Um, uh, you are probably familiar with uh, uh, raster tiles. Uh, generally, um, if we have some uh, map extent, let's say uh, the whole world, uh, we will cut it into, uh, into tiles. So first we define a bunch of uh, zoom levels. At the first zoom level, we have uh, the whole world in just a single tile. And then as uh, we go into deeper zoom levels, each time uh, we split the, a single tile into four tiles and we go like uh, this uh, until we are done. Uh, this is an example of uh, zoom level four, uh, two. So we have 16 tiles uh, in four times uh, four grid. Uh, Normally, uh, with uh, raster tiles, which uh, people are most used to, each single tile, it's, uh, it's a, let's say, single file, uh, which contains uh, uh, some raster image. Um, now, uh, if we want to uh, work with uh, vector tiles, the, this um, schema is the same, just the content of each tile is not going to be image but it will be uh, vector data. So what are those vector data actually in, uh, in those tiles? Um, essentially, um, a single vector tile uh, contains a collection of uh, vector features uh, encoded in some way. Um, each vector feature uh, has a geometry uh, and it has some uh, attributes. Um, what is also important, uh, it, uh, it's not that um, a single vector tile would contain just features from a single vector layer, but uh, there can be a combination of a uh, bunch of um, input vector layers combined in a single tile. So uh, then there's uh, the advantage that, um, for example, the client doesn't need to um, uh, request for single location, like 10 different um, uh, requests uh, the, uh, from the server, but everything is into in a single file. Um, as a very rough example to give you an idea, here's a single vector tile which contains uh, three different layers, water boundary in place, and each of those uh, layers has a, a bunch of features. So water contains uh, polygon features with some coordinates in here, which I have skipped, and some uh, attributes like class is ocean or lake. Um, boundary has uh, line geometries with some different uh, attributes and the same places with points and yet other uh, attributes. And all this is uh, packaged into a single file. So here is uh, how it looks when uh, you load it in, in QGIS. Uh, these red lines around uh, tiles are normally not shown there. They are here just for this um, demo to, to show that these are actually tiled data in those squares. And uh, this shows as we zoom in uh, to from from the whole world to the level of uh, streets. Uh, this one is uh, unstyled um, uh, data source. So you can see that all polygons, lines and uh, points, they just have a, a single style. Uh, so why vector tiles at all? Why 
can't we uh, use raster tiles all the time? Uh, there are several reasons. Uh, one is that um, vector tiles um, have generally smaller tile size. So the same uh, tile can uh, have maybe, uh, yeah, just uh, half of the size or even less of a raster tile. Uh, you need fewer zoom levels. So for example, for raster tiles, it's common to, if you want to cover the whole earth from um, uh, from continents all the way to street levels, you need probably uh, 19, 20 zoom levels. For vector tiles, you probably need just 15 and uh, that's uh, just enough. Mm, it may look like a small difference, but you need to consider that uh, it's um, uh, the number of tiles grows exponentially. So it's a huge difference if you can cut off uh, a bunch of zoom levels. Uh, then you can use dynamic styling and labeling. So you are not limited to what uh, is um, in the raster tile, um, but you can define what should be styled, what should be omitted uh, from the tiles uh, and so on, because all of that is done on the client side. Uh, there are no issues with the high DPI screens uh, because it's vector data. So with raster data, if you have uh, uh, tiles generated for, let's say, 96 DPI, they are not going to look great on, uh, on your phone or uh, tablet. Um, and you don't need any tricks to handle that for vector tiles. There is also less load on server if you uh, transfer tiles uh, from server to client uh, because yeah, they uh, take less uh, amount of data and uh, the, all the rendering is done on the client and of course uh, faster to generate. Um, this is another example of uh, data loaded in QGIS. So this is some uh, part of London and it's the same um, uh, source of vector tiles, just with a bunch of different uh, styles applied on the client, which can be switched very easily and without any extra uh, data transfer. Uh, this is another showcase of the flexibility. Here uh, we rotate the uh, map view uh, in the bottom right corner, and you can see that the, uh, the labels are still oriented uh, correctly, um, while if we would do the same with raster tiles, we get uh, the labels upside down. And another uh, such an example, uh, you can, if, if your vector tiles contain, let's say, the place names in different languages, you can very easily switch between um, uh, the labels and you don't need to create like uh, 20 different uh, tile sets uh, for each language separately. So that's also a huge advantage. Um, I have borrowed this slide from Esri um, to show um, a bit about the tile creation. If we just focus on this uh, top table here uh, to create a street map uh, vector tile set or raster tile set for the whole uh, world. Uh, with raster tiles, the volume of data is about uh, 20 terabytes and uh, it takes weeks uh, and it requires server farm with lots of cores, while the same data set um, you can create with uh, uh, for vector tiles, the volume is several orders of magnitude lower, just uh, in order of gigabytes, it takes a couple of hours and uh, you don't need a server farm. So that's a really huge difference for the creator of uh, tiles. Um, another question uh, comes up is, is why can't we just use vector uh, layers, ordinary vector layers? Well, the reason is that if, if we want to have really fast uh, maps, then the vector tiles are going to be always 
much faster than um, using plain uh, vector layers because they are optimized for this single thing just to be downloaded and rendered um, as quickly as possible. Uh, the use cases are everywhere. So the vector tiles are commonly used in web mapping, in mobiles, in, on desktops. Um, in, uh, in web maps, you may have seen, and also in mobile, you may have seen uh, these, uh, the vector tiles have been used already for quite some time by uh, Google Maps and some others, uh, and uh, they are slowly finding their way um, elsewhere uh, to replace uh, raster tiles where it makes sense. Uh, there are also a bunch of open source vector tile server implementations that um, you can use, like Tegola, Martin, T-Rex, GeoServer now also has uh, some support for vector tiles. And um, PostGIS database uh, nowadays supports um, has a function to take uh, some uh, data and convert them to uh, vector tiles. So uh, this is quite a popular option uh, to dynamically serve your uh, data from a PostGIS database. So uh, it's not that vector tiles are great for everything. Like one major area where they are not great is um, analysis and geoprocessing. And that's because uh, we are not working with raw geometries. They have been simplified, they have been clipped, and uh, it can be quite a nightmare to, uh, to do anything with it. Um, of course, uh, it's also not supposed that you would be doing some editing of uh, these vector tiles. They are exported from, from the raw data source and uh, as said, they are meant for rendering and only for rendering. Uh, the data sources you can use, there are a bunch of ways how you can um, get vector tiles. So a common use is to use the XYZ template uh, with a remote server where these X and Y and Z um, placeholders will be replaced uh, by the actual um, tile numbers uh, by the client. Uh, similarly, if you have um, vector tiles generated somewhere on your uh, local drive, you can do that uh, with uh, local files as well. Then quite a nice um, way to use uh, vector tiles is uh, the MB tiles file, which is a simple SQLite uh, database. So it's just a single file that contains the whole tile set uh, uh, in, in a single file. And uh, GeoPackage um, has a specification for vector tiles in progress, but uh, it's not uh, finished yet. And I guess uh, uh, when it will be finished, uh, we will try to support in, in QGIS as well. Um, encoding of vector tiles. Uh, so just like uh, raster tiles or ra uh, raster data in general, uh, they are... Uh, uh, encoded in, let's say, J JPEG or PNG. Uh, the most widely, most widely used format here is the Mapbox Vector Tiles specification or MVT. Um, I think it's basically used everywhere. Even S3 have uh, started to use it. GeoJSON is another option, but uh, I think it's more of kind of uh, interesting uh, bit uh, rather than being uh, used in production. Uh, in terms of styling, Mapbox GL JSON style is like the de facto standard uh, everywhere because of the nice uh, JavaScript client library that's uh, working really fast uh, and has good styling options. Uh, and so let's uh, talk about the vector tiles uh, in QGIS. So there was some previous work. Um, there is a vector tiles reader QGIS plugin, uh, but uh, it has a bunch of uh, limitations and the, the performance hasn't been that great. So 
uh, and uh, there was a lack of um, some extra functionality. So we decided it would be great to have uh, native support without the need of uh, an external plugin. Uh, and that it would be all written in C++, so it would be also fast. Uh, so we have planned the work in QG's enhancement proposal 162 with all the details. Basically, the main idea is that we would create a new map layer type. So there would be vector, uh, vector layers, raster layers, mesh layers, and now uh, vector tile layers. And in order to do that, we have started a crowdfunding campaign, which was uh, successful. So at this point, I would like to thank um, all the funders that have participated it, in it and have made this uh, possible. So thank you. Um, and so how do we load vector tiles in QGIS? Uh, there are two ways right now. Uh, you can define connections to uh, the remote or local data sources with uh, XYZ templates like you may have already done with uh, raster tiles. Uh, the other option is to use MB tiles file, which you can just drag and drop from file browser or also uh, take it from the uh, QGIS browser panel and your uh, vector tile layer is loaded. It would look like this. Uh, completely unstyled. You would just get like the basic polygon lines and points uh, styling uh, here in the uh, styling uh, panel. Now um, you can use the styling panel to define the um, styles of, uh, of the render and of the labeling. So this is how it looks like when it's uh, populated with some nice style. I have done a quick start on um, Mabox GL to QGIS style uh, converter. Uh, it's kind of unfinished, but it has been picked up by others. And I think in the next presentation, you will hear more about the conversion. Uh, you have um, identified tool support. So if you have some vector tile data, you can click uh, on the map and see all the attributes. Uh, and uh, finally, there is support for uh, creation of vector tiles. So here in the processing uh, toolbox, uh, we have the um, uh, writer for vector tiles, either using the XYZ uh, template or to uh, MB tiles file. And you just uh, simply define the vector tiles from your project, which you want to uh, export the minimum, maximum zoom level extent, if you like you would define which layers to use. And for each layer, you can configure it to set uh, uh, like its layer name and uh, expression, uh, how you want to filter it. And you get your vector tiles. Uh, there are uh, quite a few improvements we would like to do in the future. I may have forgotten to say that vector tile support comes in QGIS 3.14. Um, we would like to improve the user interface for styling, which is right now very basic. Also, right now we only support the um, Web Mercator um, uh, tile set. Uh, so that's uh, something we would like to also uh, improve. Um, um, and uh, yeah, a bunch of other things like uh, integrated processing algorithm to import or export styles from or to Mapbox GL style, um, maybe support vector tiles in the QG server, have support for attribute table, like for ordinary vector uh, layers, where you show uh, all the features in tabular form and so on. So none of this is uh, really uh, funded by anyone. So if you are to have any of those sometime soon. Um, it would be great if you get in touch with us and uh, we can uh, work, on it, work it out. And uh, that's it. So uh, thanks a lot. Thanks to you. Thank you very much for your presentation.
Um, there have been two or three questions in the chat. Uh, so the first one was a question about point clouds. Um, if there is a, a way to implement this for point clouds as well. Um, not for point clouds, but uh, we, uh, when talking about point clouds, that actually um, one of our uh, topics we would like to look into next and maybe do a crowdfunding campaign uh, to support point clouds uh, within QGIS natively. Okay. But not within uh, vector tiles. Then there was a, a question about uh, reading VT vector tiles from RGIS Pro output. Uh, with that one, I don't really know. I would need to probably see how uh, how the protocol looks like. Okay. Thank you. And then um, a question, is it an OGC standard? Mm, it is not, as far as I know. Uh, maybe there is some uh, work going on to standardize it, but maybe the speaker after me, Peter, uh, will know a bit more about that. Okay. Uh, thank you again for, for your presentation. And um, I guess if people have other questions, they can also contact you directly later on. Yeah, sure. And thanks a lot for the invitation. You're welcome. Thanks. So now I would like to introduce uh, Peter Pridal. Uh, who is founder and CEO of MapTiler, which is a company that offers services and an engine to create and self-host maps for websites and, and other products. Uh, his company is based in Switzerland this time. Um, so thank you very much for being with us today. And Peter is going to talk about the QGIS plugin for uh, Open Map Tiles. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well and see the screen? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, so um, I, I'm Peter Pridal. I work for uh, uh, I work together with a team which is based in uh, Switzerland, Czech Republic, France, and the United States. And uh, we are big supporters of open source uh, with commit commitments in uh, GDAL or commits in GDAL and uh, open layers and other tools. Uh, you may know our EPSGIO, and you may know us. Uh, under the name Glocan Technologies, um, which uh, we have used in the past. Now we are MapTiler uh, AG, in fact, in Switzerland. Um, we work on uh, base maps and uh, creating beautiful maps for developers for to be used in web applications, in mobile applications. So we are crunching uh, 6 billion features in OpenStreetMap database and combining it with additional data sources to create a street map and also processing petabytes of data uh, from the satellite and aerial imagery, especially open data, to be, have a color-toned, uh, beautiful base map of the world. This we put on a global infrastructure with 150 servers, and we can offer it to anybody who is interested to use it. Um, choose APIs from a reliable infrastructure. An example client could be uh, Swiss Railways in uh, Switzerland. As Bebe. All of this is in fact powered, like the core of our uh, of our street maps is covered by OpenStreetMap and the project uh, which is uh, turning the OpenStreetMap into vector tiles is an open source project available on GitHub. It in fact started as an academical project in Switzerland and then uh, moved to a production. Based on the estimates, it's now used by over 250 million people a month, which is amazing. If, I, if somebody would tell me that I would work on such a project, uh, it's, it would be crazy. Uh, I would not believe. Um, you can have a look at openwebtiles.org. Basically, the project is, uh, is uh, converting the OpenStreetMap planet uh, in the raw form, the OpenStreetMap data, into PostGIS with an optimized, in an optimized form with generalization and selection of tags uh, for different um, different parts of the world and different countries and then uh, later on encoding it into vector tiles either in a pre-generated form or uh, uh, as a real-time vector tiles served directly from post GIS queries with a heavy caching 
Um, the core of the Open Map Tiles project, the open source uh, part, especially is the Open Vector Tile Schema, which is basically the description of the layers and attributes. So what should be included in the vector tiles? And this is documented, extensible, and discussed and improved by the community uh, of different, uh, different individuals and, and companies working on Open Map Tiles. There is also a complete software tool stack designed for uh, for converting the OpenStreetMap data into PostGIS and then into MVT, into vector tiles um, with the Mapbox format. And uh, we have a set of open map styles, so the, the basic, bright, the, the, the look and feel and design of the maps, which are bound to the schema. So uh, other open source projects are using it and um, it was always my dream to have it inside of uh, QGIS natively. And uh, now uh, I'm really glad that uh, that uh, Lutra did the work on a native implementation of the vector tiles inside of QGIS. So we have the faster functions for loading it. And uh, today together with uh, Nierune, uh, which is our partner in Japan, uh, we are launching a plugin for, uh, for QGIS which is now available in the plugin repository, which you can load. Um, and it's calling the Lutra uh, new, uh, new APIs uh, via Python, uh, available in the latest QGIS, and um, converting the styles and giving the base maps into QGIS. Uh, this practically means if you install the plugin that you get vector base maps for the entire world. Um, we have decided that the plugin is going to implement the, the browser listing this way. And uh, you get all the benefits from these styles. So we were working hard on converting this, the GLJSON styles into, into QGIS functions for the styling. And these benefits include, as Martin mentioned, the fast interaction print in vector form, uh, custom coordinate system, so reprojection uh, without deformation, support for 50 plus languages and exports into any data you want. The plugin does not only uh, support the maps we provide uh, as part of Open Map Tiles project or MapTiler Cloud, uh, but it also allows to load any JSON style from any location. So let's have a look at the demo. So if I have if I have QGIS on my computer and the latest version, and I install the plugin, I get this sort of uh, maps on the side. Uh, so, so I have perfect, perfect maps, uh, which are available either as raster tiles or as vectors. So if I, if I uh, have a look at rasters, you probably know it from the past. Um, the, the same map is in fact now available in a vector format. Uh, so, so you get, you get super sharp uh, styling and conversion uh, of, uh, of the styles uh, available out there and you can zoom in on any place on the planet and benefit from uh, from the fast loading of uh, open street map data uh, and styling including labels uh, whenever it was possible this is a first uh, implementation um, of the conversion and it's heavily powered by what lutra did and uh, it has been done uh, together with with uh, like on our side it was adam a developer working on qgis and uh, on uh, on uh, uh, Mierune's side, Kanahiro and Kosuke uh, working on uh, on the QGIS plugin. Thanks to them, this exists, and thanks to Martin's work on the crowdfunding, crowdfunded uh, effort related to uh, to uh, vector tile native implementation. Um, the advantage is this is this is OpenStreetMap uh, in MapTiler. We are working also on additional data. So you may you may have uh, you may have also for example um, contour lines available for for entire world uh, hill shading available for entire world all of this just at your finger tips so available for styling the way you want uh, in fact you can you can modify the uh, the styles in uh, on the layers directly. Uh, you see it's a composition of the layers. Uh, so, so the vector layer is a separate layer, newly implemented. And uh, uh, you, have, you have here the styling capabilities traditionally available uh, in, uh, in, the, in the QGIS. So all the conditions and the way how the, how the beautiful base maps are styled 
is converted and you can adjust it directly in QGIS. Additional option is to be adjusting it in the cloud in our site, which just means that, that you get exactly the same uh, uh, look and feel for the map uh, from, uh, uh, from the web serving as well as for, for the printing. And uh, that's perhaps something for QGIS you can, you can uh, for the future, you can adjust multiple layers together. So, so in fact, uh, it's pretty easy then uh, to change not only one layer, but uh, but a set of layers with a certain certain direction uh, on uh, on how it should look. Once you once you save it, um, the the map is then available, and you can quite quite easily load uh, the map back to QGIS or or another uh, another tools. So it's just about copying the URL back like this. So the, the ability to add a map from any URL is in fact in here. So it may be your server, it may be, it may be uh, any location online, anybody who is serving vector tiles can, uh, uh, can load the, uh, the map uh, directly. Oh, I just type top one. If I do this and add it to the project, it loaded the, the color from modified way and I can get raster tiles as well as vector tiles from the outside. The huge advantage of doing this is also printing. So now all the exports and all the prints are available and they are in vector format. So if you, if you export, um, you get a beautiful vector PDF uh, available for print at any high resolution. The same, uh, the same is in fact happening with uh, with the additional export. So this is this is then vector PDF uh, ready to be print. It can be adjusted with DPIs for for the printing, and you can zoom in as much as you want because because all it's all of this is vector data. Um, it has always been my my dream to have the. Uh, the open map tiles inside, and I believe there is a great work, great amount of work which can be done uh, on uh, on really bringing the the open map tiles as close to um, to the uh, QGIS project. So a native styling, a native base map for QGIS can be done. I would be very happy to help to assist to adjust the open map tiles project for the purpose of QGIS. So having as native base map inside of QGIS as possible. So a summary of what the plugin can do is like load any Mapbox GeoJSON style. This this means uh, this means uh, the the style in a GeoJSON uh, Mapbox specification uh, are converted into QGIS. The QML uh, can be exported afterwards if you if you need to. Um, we have a set of uh, MapTeller cloud-based maps such as OpenZoom Stacks for Ordnance Survey or the Dutch National Data and additional available there as well, but you can really load the maps from wherever you want. Um, the printing is, is quite quite a new thing. So now we just turn on QGIS, open any place on planet, uh, get the data you need, and, and you can make printouts at high resolution. Um, the transformation in coordinate systems is, so, so it's uh, LV95 in Switzerland versus the Mercator, uh, is also pretty exciting where the maps are not deformed. So that's it. That's for the first version. I'm really keen for people to use the, the vector maps we have done. That's why we work heavily on Open Map Tiles project. And uh, I hope uh, uh, people will create uh, exciting new applications and outputs inside of QGIS. So please ping us on, uh, on Twitter if you do uh, use a hashtag MapTiler or um, have a look at the GitHub. If you go to the page of the plugin, you can, uh, you can see the source code of the, of the plugin as well. It's GPL licensed. Um, and you, you can help us to make it better or, or uh, use it the way you want. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you. The, it was very interesting. It's amazing to see what is possible. Um, thanks again to all the presenters who have been presenting this morning. Personally, I have, I've learned a lot. It was a bit of a technical adventure for me, but um, I hope you, you all enjoyed it. Um, just after we finish, there will be a, a last poll av available about, um, to just ask you about your opinion about this event. So do not leave uh, directly afterwards.
And now I again um, pass uh, over to Hans Jörg, who will uh, give you the word of the end. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, Isabel. Um, if I could manage, I would say let's give Isabel a, a great hand and a really decent clap. But um, unfortunately, this has to be virtually done. However, um, thanks again, Isabel. Very, very, very good job. And we did have some technical issues. However, I think after all, we managed to, to get a more or less very useful uh, morning session. And um, yeah, as I can see from from the chat now, I think everybody's happy. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for all your feedback. That was really packed in terms of information. And I do hope that um, most of what you heard is relevant for your work and you can integrate into your future work with Cube, JS. I mean, it's, it's also it's the community who will drive this project, who will um, make it even better, who will have creative ideas, who will invest, etc., etc. And I'm very happy that after all these years, we're still working on it. We're still seeing improvements. We're still seeing um, a lot of information, a lot of innovation, etc. So thanks for all those who contribute, be it as translators, be it as bug fixers, be it as bug reporters, be it as plugin developers, or whatever you name it. So as you can see, there is now uh, the poll going on. And um, yeah, well, thank you. I hope you all have a great day. What I'm thinking of is um, that we could do, as a Swiss user group, maybe some kind of like, uh, just what the developers do in terms of a hackathon, maybe uh, some kind of uh, documentation atom, so that we gather for all those um, who may not be as familiar with code writing, who would like to contribute to QGIS that we get together in whatever form for documentation and for translation. And uh, we'll think about that. Maybe you have some availability for that and then we, uh, we can also check on that so that uh, everybody can, can get into play. With this, I say thank you. I wish you all a happy rest of the day. Uh, enjoy your lunches. And um, Isabel, over to you. Thank you. You, I, I don't really have anything to um, to add. So, please fill in the poll and have a very nice day or night for some of you. And see you at some other events. Thanks a lot.